Thanks everyone for attending today. Uh, we're gonna run this training from 12 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we will throw a few breaks in there in between um, for rest breaks. Uh, as Matthew mentioned, Q&A is open, the chat is open. So if uh, you have questions, go ahead and type in there. Uh, if it's something that you need to uh, speak about and, and don't want to don't wish to type it in there you can raise your hand and, and we can uh, choose if we want to allow you to talk <laughs> uh, that's how zoom puts it anyways so we can uh, unmute you uh, my name is Adam Hedden I'm business development manager with Equipco Eastern Canada uh, I do understand that there are many people from all over parts of the country so welcome uh, we also have on the call here, Matthew Reed. He's our technical sales specialist with Equipco Eastern Canada. And we have Nick Berube, who is uh, outside sales in uh, Eastern Ontario, Northern Ontario, Quebec. What else do we wanna give you, Nick? Not for now. <laughs> Perfect. And then uh, last but not least, we have uh, our trainer today, Josh Gardner from uh, Triangle Tube. Uh, he is uh, from the tech services and field support. So he's going to lead the training today. And at that point, Matthew, Nick, do you have anything else to contribute before we get started? Just want everybody to have, you know, we're, we're here to have fun, have a good time. This is as much information as you folks can possibly digest today. Um, don't be shy is my only uh, comment that I'll throw to everybody. There is no uh, wrong questions or bad questions except for the ones that you don't ask. So don't hesitate. Absolutely. One last note, uh, this training will be live recorded um, and it will be added to our Equipco YouTube channel for anyone that uh, has to bow off early or anyone that missed. So thanks again for joining us and I'm going to turn it over to Josh. Thanks guys. Yeah, as Adam said, I'm a field support and design technician for Triangle Tube. Uh, specifically, I cover the Northeast and I've been covering a lot of tech support for Eastern Canada. Um, Western Canada is covered by Kevin Key. So if you guys are up there and need anything, let me know. I'd be more than happy to give you his contact info. Um, but again, uh, also you can get my contact info and hit me with any questions through email, text or phone call. Um, so and yeah, no question is a stupid question. So please ask if you are wondering, um, because that's one of the issues we have on some trainings that some guys don't want to speak up and they reach out after and ask these questions. So please feel free to reach out. So I got a bunch of stuff uh, going on in the room. Uh, I got a live fire, boiler, live fire boiler here we'll go over. I got a tear down boiler over here. Um, I got some boards that are mocked up on some piping strategies behind me. And I got one of our new floor boilers over there. Uh, prestige commercial boiler that we can go through um, and we're gonna we'll go through a little PowerPoint presentation first on some of the models and some of the um, you know admin info and then we're gonna dive into the uh, components in the unit and we'll get into the commissioning troubleshooting some service stuff breaking down an actual unit looking inside and then some of the things to look for during service calls and troubleshooting for you know failed ignitions or no heat calls. So we'll go through all of that. Um, and I guess if there's any questions, if one of the guys from Equipco could just chime in, let me know. And uh, if there's any issues with audio, you know, let me know. Cool, um, all sounds great right now, Josh, everything's good. And uh, yeah, we'll be monitoring that uh, chat box when anything does come up that we can't handle, we'll definitely throw it over to you. Perfect. All right, so let me see. I'm not sharing my screen right now, right? Correct. Beautiful. Yeah. Yes, sir. We see it. All right. Let jump in here. So we'll go over the instinct, the instinct floor. Um, we can touch in the tanks and then also the prestige. So looking at our InSync wall boilers, um, we essentially have five different units currently. So we have two combination units, a 155 and a 199. 
Um, those come with system pumps. On the 155, our turndown ratio on all these boilers is eight to one. Um, max output in the 155 is obviously 155. Minimum is 19,000. Um, the 70 degree rise, we get about four gallons per minute on the domestic. The 199, essentially the same thing, but we get 5.3 gallons per minute on the domestic. One thing with these boilers, we'll go in and we'll look at the controls. We can derate these boilers. So I can actually drop the rating on the heat output at 155 to essentially whatever I want. So if you guys are sizing these units on the domestic load for the combis, we can turn down the CH heating mode and derate these boilers, all right? Um, those combi boilers come with system pumps already installed. So you'll pipe out of it with your, uh, either going right into your closely spaced T's or your low loss header, depending on what you prefer. And then on our current solo heat only models, we have a 110, a 155 and a 199. Um, same specs, but on those boilers, they do not include the system pump right now. Um, once we come out, I think at the end of next year, we'll be having a V2 series on the boiler. Um, all of our boilers will have system pumps installed, but just understand the heating only, you'll have to provide that pump. Pros and cons, uh, one is most guys prefer you know, to have that in there. They just throw the boiler in, call it a day. Um, some guys, and I'm kind of in this camp, uh, I like not having the system pump. That way I can size that pump according to my output and according to my, uh, my design. So I have a little bit of flexibility there on what my output, my GPM is out of that boiler. Hey, Josh, we had a question pop through as to how far down you can derate uh, the boilers. So we can technically go all the way down to zero, um, but I think there's a default. I think we get on the 155 down to about 60,000 BTUs and the 199 is about 80,000 BTUs. If you have questions, reach out to us directly. I have some charts that give you some percentage to the output um, and also a calculation on that as well. So if you do want more info, contact me on that, or you could email tech services and we have that, we can send that directly. Looks like we've got a couple more questions coming right now. Uh, yeah, there was one question that happened here. Uh, if modulation, if it's a mod boiler, why do you need to derate the boiler? I'm just typing in an answer here to that one now. Yeah, it, it'll just prevent it into, uh, go into high fire. So for instance, my boiler at home, I got a 199. My load of my house is about 60,000 BTUs. I derated it to 50%. My boiler has never came out of mid fire. It's always stayed in the low fire, uh, low to mid fire region. So new to our line is the floor boilers. Um, this is really where I see a lot of advantage. I see a lot of the market kind of going this way where wall boilers, you know, we had these come out in our market because over in Europe, they're doing wall boilers and they mount in the kitchen, their cabinet depth, and they fit in there nice and tight. Everything's crammed in there. Well, I think we're finally, you know, in the past five, six years realizing that we have basements and we have much more room. So we're looking at ways to save money on install, save time because manpower is a big thing as well. So if we don't have to build a wall, like can we can mount or just set a boiler on the floor, it's a great way to go and we can save that time. The boiler itself is the same, same boiler. We have the same components, actually the same parts. Um, the cabinet's a little bit different and the piping arrangement's a little bit different inside. Um, but with all of our floor boilers, your primary piping's done. So the boiler comes out of the box, with a Kalefi low loss header install uh, in there. So all you're gonna do is take that Kalefi low loss header, put it on either the right side or left side. The boiler can be piped either way, it's universal. Um, on the floor boilers, you have your gas, your water, your condensate coming off on either side, and then your domestic connections and your vent terminations come directly off the top. So with the Kami boilers, pretty much the same models, we have a 155 combi, 199 combi. Um, 
four gallons a minute on the 155, the 199 gets about 5.3. The solar models, pretty much the same, 110, 155, 199. But again, we have the system pump, in, uh, the prop boiler primary pump installed, and your, your primary piping's already done. So on these floor boilers, you're just gonna come off the low loss header on the supply side, and go right off to your zones because that low loss header is your air separation, your hydraulic separation, your dirt separation, um, all in one unit. So you just come off, go to your zone T's, the supplies, and then on the returns, you just bring it right back with your return T's and your boiler fill. So warranty 10 and six, we'll go over the warranty. I think we'll see the slide in here on the parts and heat exchanger, maybe a couple of slides in. Uh, but to go over some of these parts, we'll dive into this thing and tear into it. This is showing just some of the quality, you know, high quality parts that we have in here. Um, so, you know, triangle tube didn't really skimp on this. We went with some of the highest quality components. Um, you know, we kept it pretty simple in this cabinet is which I really like on the boiler. Um, but we made it very easy to service. So pretty much all these components we can remove without having to remove something else, which I think is the most important part. So all these boilers, no matter what manufacturer, they need service at the end of the day. Um, you know, they need to be serviced every year. So there's components in there that we need to change. And having those components being able to remove and change easily is quite important when you're talking about service, opposed to some of these units that cram you know, everything in there as much as they can. So we've down fired, you know, tube heat exchanger on this boiler. Um, you know, something you'll see in the sales marketing and the sales guys, it's, you know, self-cleaning. Um, you know, it, it's the burners being uh, fired down. We have that condensation also building up in our tubes and going down and through our heat exchanger. And, the condensation will pull a lot of that debris in and out. But around this heat exchanger, you can still have sediment and debris build up in here. So with natural gas, these things run pretty darn clean. Natural gas is pretty clean if it's set up properly, the burner and your combustion. Propane, eh, tends to be a little bit dirtier. Um, so on the service aspect, you know, you're not getting in there every year. To pull this burner and clean it. This unit 100% should be serviced and looked at every year. Your gas pressure should be checked. Your combustion should be checked, but you're not necessarily pulling that burner every year. Most of the debris is going to be pulled down through the condensation um, and down in through the bottom of our pan and out through our condensate trap and into the pan through here. So it is technically, you could say it's self cleaning, but there's still debris that can build up in here. All right, so I don't want you guys to think that this is self-cleaning for the life of the unit. You never have to pull it. 100%, you got to pull it. Um, and we'll go over some of the cleaning methods here in a little bit. So 439 stainless steel, um, large surface area in there. we got a pretty good size heat exchanger. On the 110, the boiler holds about two and a half gallons of water. The 155, about three and a half gallons. And the 199, we're about four and a half gallons. Um, on the warranty, good, better, best, good, 10 years on the heat exchanger, one year in part, better, 10 years, uh, five and two, the best, 10, six and three. So the whole thing with this is the registration. As long as you register that boiler and put your combustion settings in there, and I'll show you an analyzer I have that makes it really easy, so you get this warranty, all right? And it's really easy to register this boiler on site, so go to the website, I'll show you guys. Um, actually, probably, oh, right there, there you go. Yeah, from the main screen, registration is across the top bar. Yeah, I think I missed it. So registering the product, you'll just have the installer's information. So your information and the homeowner's information you'll enter in. And if you save this, if you have an iPhone, save this as a home screen button, it's much easier to, um, to connect into. Then you'll have your product info, serial number. That's the most important part for us. 
that tells us what the boiler model is, all the information when it was made, and we can track everything. And then your combustion settings. Now, if you're on the job site and you have your analyzer, you don't technically need to fill in all this information. You just got to go in, take a picture of your analyzer in high fire, take a picture of it in low fire, making sure that your combustion settings are within our parameters in the manual, and then drop those pictures here, and then go ahead and hit submit. And then you'll get a, uh, it'll load, and it'll say, thank you for registering. You'll get an email soon. That will go to our warranty department. They'll log it, and probably within a week, you'll see an email saying, welcome to the family, your boiler is now registered. So um, definitely should do that on every install. That is, it gets you that, that best warranty. If you don't do it, you'll still get a warranty, but why not? It's pretty easy. It takes a couple minutes. So some piping applications, this is just showing, this is a quick PowerPoint that we use. Um, I'll show you guys some stuff on the boards, but we have low loss headers and closely spaced tees. The only time, the only thing we really don't want to see in these boilers is a pipe straight in and out as an old boiler. So there's some circumstances we can do that with fan coils um, where we're running, say, one inch to it, unlike the 110s. But we need to make sure that we size the pump properly. We have proper flow through that boiler and we uh, uh, account for the head loss in our coil as well, too. Still, with a lot of those applications, I like to see closely spaced T's or, T's or low loss headers. But with the pricing on low loss headers now and time and labor, this thing just makes sense. Um, it's all this right here wrapped up into one nice tight unit. So it makes it a little bit cleaner. It works really well. And I get, when guys use low loss headers, I get zero calls on delta T's and pumping issues. Um, closely spaced tees, if not done right, size properly and installed properly, um, I'll get calls on Delta T and have to go out, take a look, and we'll end up having to change piping or pumps. So, if you a loss setter is great. If not, if you're using closely spaced tees, just make sure you're doing it correctly. This is the manifold kit we have. It's good, not bad, but again, recommend low loss setters. Um, I'm not going to get into the wiring right now because I'm going to do it right in live time. My camera. <laughs> Some of the stuff I'm just going to skip through. And this is the floor boiler. So, like I said, makes everything a little bit faster. And some of the highlights. Um, went through pretty much all of this. Cascading, so our instinct boilers, all of our boilers pretty much use the same control mat. So on all of our instincts and prestiges, we can cascade these boilers up to six. Um, the only thing you need to purchase is a cascading cable. So the cable will plug into the master um in the control and then it will go to the other ones on the board to the next one to the next one to the next one and you do not need an auxiliary control a tech mar um, or anything to set these up so that cascading is already built into these boilers which is kind of nice so commercial applications you know that's probably the most common but i'm from maine and from the down east area right on the ocean we got a lot of people that have summer homes and they want um, a backup boiler, having that redundancy. So we'll see a lot of installations with a 110 or a 155 with an indirect, and we just have a backup boiler with that. So it's a great option that with these residential boilers, we can do that. <coughs> also with that floor boiler, it comes with the 120 output for the condensate pump. Um, all the boilers come with the LP kit included for the conversions. Um, and then another thing I'll show you guys on this is the boiler right here next to the control uh, has a Wi-Fi control. So we'll go through some of that. I'll show you guys um, my boiler at my house and you can kind of get an understanding of how that looks and what you can actually expect out of that Wi-Fi um, controller. 
And this is the low loss header that we sent to it. I think that's a, what was it, 548 or 545. Pretty basic. The only thing that this doesn't have, which I kind of wish they put on there, but I think it was a cost thing, uh, was the magnetic separation. So if you do go into a system where you have cast iron radiators or you're concerned about metal particles, I would definitely add a magnetic separator on there. Hopefully next series of boilers, we have that in, but I think it was just a cost thing, keeping the boiler cost down um, because that would have kind of rounded this whole thing out for every installation. But you don't need magnetic separators on every install, especially in new installs where we're just using copper and plastic. So low loss header can be bolted right onto the left or right. If you buy the 110 and the 155, you're gonna get a one inch separator. And if you go with the 199 combi or heat only, you're going to get an inch and a quarter there's a low loss header. Also, your condensate will be down through here. It'll come out on either side. Your outlet will be located right here. And then there's knockouts on either side for the gas line. The gas line will come out straight out through the back of the boiler right here. All right. So it just comes straight out with a small nipple. It's a male nipple, three quarter inch. So from there, a little trick or just to keep in mind when you install it is you want to wind these fittings on first before you push this boiler up against the wall. So you're going to want to put a 90 on here. If you come out on the right side, and if you have a 90 and a five inch nipple, that will get you right outside that cabinet. And then you can run your drip leg and your gas line up or your gas line down or over whatever way you want to go. Then if you want to go over to the left side here, you'll need an 18 inch nipple to get you right outside the jacket. You can go longer, but just to get you outside right here, enough room to get your drip leg on, about 18 inches. And then you can go either side. So we went back and forth with a lot of contractors and what we wanted to see, but ultimately that kept us, gave us the most universal install. But just keep in mind, before you tuck this thing up against the wall, put that 90 on there and put those nipples on. That way it's sticking out and you can easily install your gas line after you put it in there. Let's run the low off header on the side. The domestic connections will come up right off the top. Uh, we got plenty enough room back there if you guys want to use one of the Kalefi crossover mixing valves, which we highly recommend. I got one on the boiler right here that I'll show you guys on one of the wall hungs. Um, <clears throat> also, you will have your uh, high vent and relief valve piped off the top right here. This comes in the box as a little accessory box with the boiler. And then your vent terminations come off the top as well. Um, so on the either side, on the other side that you don't use the low loss header, installed will be little uh, coin vents. So you can purge air out if you want to. Also on the bottom of this boiler, uh, we get that call a lot, but in the, do you guys see my camera? Hi Josh, no, we can no longer see your camera. You can't. Okay, so there's a little uh, box that comes with the um, you know. Yep. Yes, no, we got you. So you get an accessory box that comes with it. So the floor boiler is in the accessory box. This, is, this one was for a wall boiler. But in your accessory box, you're going to get a little brass um, bleeder key. And that has a little square end on it, and that's used for the bleeder ports on the not used low loss header side. But on the bottom of the boiler where all our piping is, there's bleeder valves in the bottom. So if you want to completely drain this boiler down and get all the water out of it for service purposes or if you're winterizing it, whatever, um, there are bleeders on the bottom points of this boiler. So we do have a drain down point at the lowest point in the boiler to get that water out. Josh, question came up uh, with regards to the boilers themselves. Um, the low water cutoff that's installed inside these guys, is it the pressure type low water cutoff where it activates on low pressure? Yeah, it's a pressure low water cutoff. It's a pressure switch, low water cutoff. It's approved as a low water cutoff. Um, it shows your water pressure in live time on the control as well. Perfect, thank you very much. Also, you can see here on this install, we tied in our water connection in here. 
this is a good place. You can totally tie your water feed into here with your thermal expansion. Um, I tend to like to do it on the return side right here um, on most installs, especially with these low loss headers. That way when I'm filling the system or running it and I get air up in here after the install, um, I'm treating that water as it comes in, but I'm also any air that comes back in through um, is gonna be treated in my low loss header as well. So this is totally fine, but I tend to find that we get all the air out much easily or easier if you have your fill right here. But this is totally fine if you guys wanna pop out one of those high vents and just wind it in right there. And I believe that is, um, that's one inch coming out of there, male, but on the inside, it's half inch. Yeah, that's half inch female. So you can wind a half inch male adapter right in there and come out pressed or sweat or whatever you want. <coughs> this is the app we'll go through um, and the warranty. Going over that, going over some parts. This is just a little bit of a breakdown. This one shows the a gas nipple here. We toyed around with that, but essentially it's going to be a knockout and the gas line will come out right in the back. And this is what the top of the boiler looks like. So this cover flips up and this cover pops off for the service. And if you look inside, once I get the camera over there, you guys will see it's pretty much the same boiler. Indirect. Smart tanks, 316 stainless steel. Um, so this is a tank within a tank, so it's a little bit different with the coil. We get a little bit better output with it. Um, comes with an Aquasat built into it. Our boilers all come with 12K sensors. All of our sensors on our boilers that we'll go through are all 12K, um, but our boilers do come with the 12K sensor, so you could remove this Aquasat and dump in our sensor if we want to utilize some of the post-purge functions as well too. And that's just a, shot, a screenshot of the inside of the tank, what it looks like, their dip tube, the uh, dry well with our sensor. And then the acid pickling that we have that we're starting to do with our tanks. Keeps it cleaner, welds look better, holds up a lot better, uh, adds for a real clean, strong product. Um, again, registering the tank. So if you're doing a boiler and a tank, there'll be an option to register that tank well as well. So you get that lifetime warranty and labor. All right, that's PowerPoint. So let's take a look at this app real quick while I got this up. Um, now you guys are gonna see this, this is ideal. Uh, ideal essentially is around here in New England, um, one of the brands, but essentially ideal and triangle tube, same thing, ideal, purchased trying to a while ago. So essentially the same products, couple, few little minor tweaks, but um, my house, I have an ideal, so I have the ideal app. So I just don't have a uh, Wi-Fi module in the triangle tube. So essentially triangle tube look exactly like this, but the header will be green. It will say triangle tube, everything else is the same, just so you guys know. But this is my boiler in my house. So this is the Wi-Fi connection. So that Wi-Fi control, it's real simple, there's one button on it and there's three lights. So when you initially fire it up, the power green light will come on and the blue Bluetooth will come on and then the um, Wi-Fi signal will be red. And it'll be looking for a Bluetooth signal. So you'll download the app first and these instructions are in the box, you'll get them. So, you know, don't worry, you don't have to remember it. When you open up the boiler, it'll tell you how to go through it. But essentially what we're gonna do is just Bluetooth connect with your phone to the app, to the module. Once you connect, it's gonna have you pick a Wi-Fi connection, Wi-Fi router in the house. You'll connect to that. You'll put the homeowner's um, uh, password in or the homeowner could do it. And once you put the password in, you'll hit submit, it'll connect and then you're done. <clears throat> then the homeowner can go in set up users, or you could set it up depending on what customer you have. Um, and it basically, this app will give you information and it will give you lockout. So when we go through the control, you'll see it's pretty much the boiler info and lockouts. You're not gonna be able to go in and set this boiler up with the Wi-Fi, which I think is good. I wanna stay away from that um, because 
you know, as you guys know, homeowners will figure it out one way or another. They'll get online and they'll find a way to go in and mess this thing up. So you can go in and you can look at all your ignitions. So it has your boiler information, your serial number, service, you know, what's everything that's going on. But if we go into our system dash dashboard, I can see all my ignitions, my run times, DHW ignitions. Obviously, I don't have anything for my domestic cooked up my boiler. Uh, what my boiler is doing right now, uh, my water pressure in live time, um, supply return temps, boiler flue temps, my outside temperature, 41 degrees up in Maine right now. That's nice out there. Should be outside. Um, firing rate and my ionization current. This is all good info. Um, but at the end of the day, probably not going to use a lot of this. Um, I worked with Honeywell before. We had a program like this. We beta tested with some contractors. They used this info with customers for probably the first few months, and then they didn't use it. Where I really see this um, as a selling point for contractors to homeowners is with our alerts and notifications. So with most of the systems, and you can see, I installed it good. We got no alarms here, but our alerts, if we had a failed ignition, Delta T issues or anything like that, this is where it would pop up. It would also send the homeowner an email or the contractor, if you were a user on here, it'd send you an email as well too. So the way I kind of explain it is most of the homeowners are trying to get this notification if they're away, if something goes down with their thermostat. And in our thermostats, our, tri our nests, which are horrible, uh, Ecobees, Honeywells, all those, you basically set a low temp or a high temp alarm. So if the house drops below 55 degrees, you get an email notification. Well, if your house drops below that, you could have the piping in the walls be much colder and you're running the risk of freezing. With this, we can get an alert as soon as that boiler goes down. So essentially we can get a notification or you could get a notification before that house even drops a degree or two. And we know that boiler went down, that way the homeowner can call you and say, hey, look, I got an issue, can you go over and check it? That's really where I see this shining right now. And we're, this is, at, is in construction, so we're slowly adding more features, more functions. But for right now, that's really where I see an easy sell to homeowners and saying, hey, look, we get immediate notification if this thing goes down, opposed to thermostats giving it to you when the temperature drops below a certain point. Perfect. Mm -hmm. I just, just wanted to uh, chime in here real real quick. Um, these Triangle 2 boilers uh, and these hydronic systems, just so everyone here is where they are 100% compatible with the Nest thermostat for your setup. Just if yeah. there's any questions on those smart thermostats and how they work with the system, just go ahead and let us know. But they're absolutely, they do work. Yep, they do work. The Nest work, the Ecobee works. Honeywell works. Um, I would just, you just gotta be careful with the power robbing functions. Um, I really, I think up in Canada, you guys have a company called Fastat, um, which is a common maker. Yeah. You can use it to add one wire up to, I think like six. Um, that is what I really recommend if guys really can't get a third wire in there for a common, those are great. That company's awesome to deal with. Great product, I put a bunch of them in. I've had zero issues with them. So yeah, if I have the, to recommend that. The the fast eye one is available. Also, Google does make one themselves that they uh, sell for like it's like cheap, like fifteen to twenty bucks for the uh, to turn a three wire into a four wire, so you can have your common line. So they're all available through the manufacturer. Awesome. Yep. So, but yeah, the thermostats will work totally. So I'm not saying you know get rid of those. In my house, I got this app and the notifications, but I also have Prestige thermostats which are about 350 bucks a pop. So, you know, I like the fun stuff and notifications on everything, but those thermostats 100% still work with our system. So that's really the app. I mean, it gives you that information, your alerts and alarms, and we're slowly adding to this more. <coughs> so if you go into the app store with Triangle Tube, uh, it's gonna be, I believe it's labeled T-Sync. So you can go ahead and download that app. The floor boilers come with it. Um, the wall boilers 
Um, you guys can see this to be some of the first ones. Now my boiler is a wall boiler, which technically doesn't have the Wi-Fi built in, but we are having a supply chain wait, like most people, that we have an add-on module, this guy right here, that is essentially the Wi-Fi module that's in the floor boiler that'll be able to wire directly into the Modbus connection right here. There'll be three thermostat wires that'll go from here to here, and then that will enable the wall boilers and they'll be Wi-Fi enabled. So those products, those Wi-Fi modules, we hope to see in a year. I've been beta testing mine now for a year or so, and I've had really no issues with it. It's worked great. So um, the boilers you guys have putting in, just so you know, we will be able to bring those units online at some point. So there's a microchip in there, and I believe there's a supply chain issue with that. So we're just waiting on those. Once the UK gets those, we'll, we'll start seeing them pop up in New Jersey, and then we'll start shipping them out. Perfect. Josh, quick question. The onboard controller, does, does the Triangle Tube onboard control board have a 24 volt common output on it? Currently, no. Okay. Um, it does not. We have a 120 output for an outlet or lights in the boiler, whatever you want. But, and you could run a transformer in that. Um, but right. we do not, not have a 24 volt dedicated output, which 100% we know we need. Um, and on the next version of boilers, 100% will have it. We got confirmation Excellent. on that. Thank you, Josh. And uh, while you're doing that, uh, Steve had a question about, uh, with regards, does the um, low temperature alarm auto start the circuit pump to prevent freeze to, pre to prevent freeze up? And the answer to that is yes. Yes, we do have that. Yeah. You see that bar at the bottom? There you go. So is the my compute uh, my video? Yep, we see your well. It's a picture of the boiler that we're looking at right now. Okay. So I guess we can go through the boiler, the wall hung from top to down. So on top of the boiler, we'll have. So first you're gonna get the boiler, you're gonna open it up and you're gonna have paperwork. You're gonna have a parts kit. Right here, it's gonna have your high vent. It's gonna have your fittings to make up the high vent and the relief valve comes with it. Also comes with our propane conversion kit. Some lag bolts for the bracket. Stainless steel screens for the venting. Floor boiler, you'll get that little key. And then also we package some gaskets, extra ones in case you lose them. And then you also get a condensate trap as well. And there'll be a tube for the condensate trap with it. And then you'll also get, I don't have the full complete thing just because I want to show you guys, you'll get the outdoor sensor, which comes with the boiler as well too. So you will get that, which you can use if you want to. Um, one thing with our boilers on the wall hungs, which is really nice, is our bracketing system for hanging the boiler. So if you look, our bracket actually sits above the boiler. So in some manufacturers, the hang bracket is behind here on the boiler. Um, with ours, it's actually above it. And you'll be able to basically pick up this boiler, physically look at the bracket and line it up with the pieces of metal that are coming off the top of the boiler and slide it right on. So you don't have to sit there and try to finagle it and hook it up you can actually phys physically see what you're doing, which makes it a lot easier to install, which I really like that we did that. Um, vent terminations up top. So we'll get into the venting right now. <clears throat> On our vent terminations, 
we have, this is what it looks like on both sides. We have a test cap, all right, of both on the intake and exhaust. And then we have a step down gasketed system. So this boiler right out of the box can handle three inch PVC, CPVC and poly. So Duravent or Centrotherm, whatever you guys prefer using. And we have that step down gasket system. So we do not need vent adapters if we're using the poly system. On the 110s, we can run two inch PVC um, up to 28 feet. Uh, but with that, you will need a piece of three inch PVC and a reducing coupling and reduce it down. Um, I don't recommend two inch just because I've seen issues with it. Um, we are creating a higher velocity. So if we do have any venting issues and our terminations aren't good, um, we run a higher velocity through it and we can bring in some of that incomplete combustion and cause cross-contamination issues. So I highly recommend using three inch on three inch PVC and poly, CPVC, we can run up to a hundred feet for venting. Um, and then on PVC, every 90 is five feet and every 45 is three feet. And I recommend using long sweep 90s. You can use regular 90s, but anything we can do to uh, relieve the restriction is best. With CPB, uh, with poly, every 90 is 10 feet and every 45 is five feet. So we got a little bit more restriction there, but poly I think is a better way to go because it's essentially designed for exhaust, it can handle higher stack temperatures. If you guys are running glycol through the water side of your systems, our boilers are rated up to 50% glycol which is pretty much most manufacturers like Grunfest, Taco, their pumps, they're all 50%. Um, our region, we're really not running over 30%, but just so you know, we are rated up to 50. If you do use glycol, this is where the venting needs to be changed. You gotta have poly on there or CPVC to handle those higher stack temperatures. When we use glycol, um, it's a little bit thicker than water. Water is moving slower and it doesn't remove the heat as well through the heat exchanger. So we've reduced efficiencies um, and we have higher stack temperatures and that's why we need to change from PVC on the venting with glycol. I hate glycol, we don't have to use it, you know, I'd rather not, but with glycol, definitely should be testing it once a year. And also you're probably gonna change it out with most manufacturers every five years. So just keep kind of keep that in mind. Um, on the venting, so on our venting, we have some concentric vent kits that are approved. Um, this is kind of new. We just released this not too long ago. So you can see we can use a bunch of different concentric vent kits. The Durvent Centrotherms tend to work the best. <laughs> we want to stay away from the bay vent ones that have the intake all the way around or the PVC bazooka kits that exhaust two inch through the middle and have the intake all the way around the outside. A couple reasons, one, uh, they don't have screens on the inlet. So we tend to find a lot of mouse nests and birds and crap in there and that gets in through our intake system. Uh, number two, in low fire conditions, they recirculate horribly. So we see a lot of cross contaminations with those kits. Um, those kits were initially developed for through the roof penetrations and they work well through those because the exhaust is higher than the intake. But at some point in the early 2000s, we started using them on sidewall because it was one penetration and they were really cheap. So those PVC bazooka kits, I would highly recommend staying away from. Try to find a concentric kit if you're gonna use one that has your intake on the bottom. Okay, those are those typically use the best. So these are a couple examples of the venting. Now we do have an engineering bulletin that came out. We changed some of our manuals. Um, we found a couple issues with a couple venting terminations. But essentially, this installation on the venting 
probably one of the best installs you can have. <coughs> we can have our vent terminations on different walls. So if you can pull your intake somewhere else, your exhaust on another wall, that's great. Um, I kind of like using the analogy of a car. We have our intake for the fresh air from the combustion coming in the front, and we have our exhaust in the back. So these are just minimals, but the farther we can keep away, the exhaust and the intake is better. Prevents that cross contamination down the road. Not going to be issue up front, but three years, four years down the road, we can definitely see the cause of it. So if you look on here, our air intake is just coming out and 90 down. So on this intake, 100% every install, we got to try to 90 that down. Now, if you got to go up and snorkel up with your air intake, like this one, this install actually is not approved anymore. We have a engineering bulletin that's in the boxes with all the new boilers that shows it, but this is okay. We just need to put a small piece of pipe in here or a street 90 and 90 it down. Some installs in some locations, we found that we were pulling in rain in here and I'll show you on the teardown, but we have a piece of foam on the intake and we have our Venturi. So if we have water coming in here, we can clog that up we can have failed ignition issues. Or if we don't do our exhaust properly, we can cross contaminate in really cold weather and bring that condensation in here. And then it comes directly into that Venturi and just turns it into a big ice ball. And then we have no heat. So the intake is always gonna be 90 down, depending if you gotta get this up over the snow level or if you have something down here, um, but just, Note that you have to terminate it and 90 it down just like this. Um, so it shows that one inch off the wall, we can have that intake right up tight against the wall. Um, then minimally, we need 12 inches of separation side to side, and we need 12 inches of uh, separation from the face of this 90 to the bottom of this 90. And one thing to note on here, and this has been <clears throat> talked about a lot is the exhaust off the wall to the face of this 90, 12 inches. Um, that's pretty far. And we've had some inspectors kind of hit on that. We've had people ask if we can reduce that or do we really need to do that? So I think you're going to see that change down the road. Um, I don't think we have to have that on a lot of installations and a lot of installs. Our engineers are looking at it, we're testing some things, it's on the docket. So I know that question will probably come up or some of you guys are wondering, you know, can I make this shorter? Because by the time you have the overhang in some installations, you could have snow and ice come down and hit this pipe. So we gotta be kind of mindful of that. So if we have that minimal, then we gotta keep this 12 inch distance. But if we have, potentially over that 12 inch, technically it doesn't have to abide by that and we could have this closer to the wall. So this goes to my point is if we could separate these as far as we can, all right? We get hundred feet one way, hundred feet the other way. We don't have to be on the same wall for pressure. Um, we could use a chimney kit. So you could go through, <coughs> since we have some pictures in here. This is just showing some cascade applications. And could use, I guess, that picture. So, you know, we could penetrate through the wall and bring our exhaust up through here. And then we could bring our air intake through here, or vice versa. Um, if you're going to bring in fresh air intake, again, we need it 90 down, candy cane down, prevent any water coming through here. And if this is our air intake, we do need a 90 on here or we can just come out with a 90 and drop it straight down right here. Um, through the roof applications um, are great um, because we get a lot of that rainwater that will come back down through and help keep our condensate trap clean. So that's one advantage of going through the roof is having that rainwater come down and help clean out that trap a little bit and uh, get some of that gunk out of there. On the cascading, you can see pretty much the same thing. If we're doing multiple boilers, um, having that separation, again, the 90s down. But the 
Um, chimney kits that Centra Therm and Dura event has are great. Those are 100% approved for installs. So if you're gonna bring your exhaust up through a chimney, totally can do that, no issues there. Um, what else with our venting? I think that's pretty much it. Any questions on venting? Before I move on. Oh. All right, so all the boilers. All the boilers will have a small piece of foam installed in the air intake. <coughs> This foam is for acoustics, that's it. So there'll be a small piece in there on all of our boilers. You leave that in there, it goes on every one of our units, even the floor boilers. The 110 and 155 on propane, there'll be a second piece of foam in the boxes that needs to go inside the air intake. And it can go anywhere. It can go in the piece of pipe right above it. That's where most guys put it. They'll stick it right in, or it could go up at another location. Um, totally fine, wherever you guys want to put it. This just helps reduce any sort of harmonic noise that we have. Typically we see it on propane. Don't really see it on natural gas, but on some locations where propane is really lean, we can have it, um, but it is pretty rare on those applications. So looking at the unit, uh, let's see if I can get into this one. Working from the top down, we have our air intake on this side. So there's a three by two rubber boot right here. We have a factory piece of foam installed in here. All right, our air comes in through here, and then we have our venturi. So our venturi is what is mixing our air and gas. Um, so if you have poor venting, this is where we can have issues. So our air is coming in through right here. There's a couple dampers in here, and you can see there's a damper on the boiler side. And our gas comes in through here. There's two orifices on the top and bottom. This is a sealed unit. So this thing, if we get debris in here, leaves, this can stick up. So on some calls you have for service, no heat, um, check that venting. If you think you got debris in there, this is where it tends to usually get caught up. All right. And this is pretty much the only thing we change on the conversions. So the units come with the natural gas unit installed. The LP orifice um, will be in the box. So you'll swap these out, all right? This is the only mechanical thing we'll swap out. We'll do the conversion. After we swap that out, we're gonna go into the control and we need to change a setting in the control, the appliance code setting. So also in the boiler, you'll get a sticker and that sticker will have the LP info. So up here, we have the serial number of our boiler. Down here, we'll have our appliance code. That appliance code will tell the boiler if it's natural, propane, combi, and then what size. So if you're converting, you'll take the new propane sticker, put it right over this one. That way we know it's converted. And then you'll look at the LP code and the appliance code, and you'll enter it in here on the control. And that's the only single change on the unit. So that is basically all you'll do for the conversion. It's pretty simple, not too much to it. And then you'll go through and you'll set up your combustion. Okay. So the Venturi then goes into the fan. We have our gas tube coming over in here. And then we have our air regulation right here. All right, that comes through and ties into our gas valves for the firing rate. So one thing also to note during service, um, look at this gas tube, look at this brass connector in here, make sure you don't get debris. If you're using PVC, make sure you get all the shavings out of your pipe before you install this. That way we don't get PVC shavings up in here and clog this up 
and prevent our gas valve from opening up or going into high fire. Then our fan comes down, goes into our burner top. Um, the gas line comes over into our gas valve, which then goes down into the gas valve connection. Our exhaust tube is right over on here, our exhaust line. And then again, the fittings that come with it, you'll get a nipple, you'll get a T, your high vent, Kalefi, the thread into right here, and then you'll have a 90, street 90, and then your relief valve, which you can pipe off the side of the boiler. The top, our ignition transformer, okay. Grounding wire, always wanna make sure that's nice and tight, the grounding. Grounding is always very important. This grounding wire goes right down, should be installed right here. These are service boilers, so we run live fire tests, contractors with them. Um, so we have 120 in here. This is coming from our control board up to our ignition transformer. This red wire follows down and goes right into our control board. This is our ignition flame signal. So if we're trying to read a milliamp signal or microamp, we can do it on our control, but it shows it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It doesn't show it in tenth. So if you're really trying to do some troubleshooting, it might be better to get your meter out and then you run it in series with this. So you pull this lead off and you'll take your meter, clamp one lead onto the red wire and the other lead onto the spade connector on the board. And you'll run this in series through your multimeter to get your microamp signal. And this will give you a little bit more precise signal. Um, on our flame signal, we'll drop out about 0.75 microamps. Um, low fire, you're typically, <clears throat> if the burner's set up properly, you'll run around three to five on low fire. And then when you get up into high fire, you'll be up in the 20 to 28 range. It's kind of what you're looking for. So if you're a little weaker on there, definitely look at your flame, your igniter, there's some issue or something dirty with that, or also check your combustion. Um, so that's the igniter. Also it's removed off our control board. So if we do have an ignition, ignition issue and we have to change this out, you don't have to change the entire board. It's an entirely separate unit. Um, ignition lead down or igniter, ground wire, ground wire, and then we have a little sight glass here as well too. Uh, gas valve, turn the gas off for a second. So gas valve, gas comes in right here, grounding wire, voltage into the gas valve, our solenoid incoming gas pressure, offset, don't really use the offset for much testing, most of the time we're just using the inlet gas pressure. Now, this is the offset screw. Um, we'll go through it, but this offset screw is what we use to adjust the pressure coming out of the gas valve. The only times that we're gonna have to adjust this is on some propane applications where we're running too lean and we've opened our throttle all the way, we'll then have to sometimes get into this to adjust it. This is our very sensitive screw. And I would recommend if you are first time trying this to call us, call tech support. We'll walk you through this. I'll show you guys exactly some of the things that we're gonna to explain to you. But this um, is really delicate. We gotta be careful. We don't wanna turn it too fast and too much because we can damage that um, diaphragm and those springs in there. Underneath here, this little brass screw right here, flathead, that's our throttle. So that's gonna be our adjustment. It's not super sensitive. You could turn it a full turn and maybe watch it drop five tenths. So um, this one, you don't have to worry about messing anything up. If you do it too fast or too slow, it's pretty forgiving on that throttle unit, okay? Then working in the back here, we have our flu temperature sensor, which is this guy right here, wire harness is in yellow, uh, 12K sensor on this as well too. Um, over here on our supply line coming down, we have another sensor. This is our supply sensor and we put it in red, kind of makes sense. 
Again, 12K sensor, wet well if you do pull this sensor, so make sure you drain down the boiler. <coughs> and this sensor <coughs> is different than our flu sensor, um, but our supply sensor, our return sensor, and our domestic sensor down here are all the same sensor. So you can stock one sensor and cover all those through. So working down, again, blue one, return temperature sensor right here. And then back in here, this is our low water cutoff, our pressure switch down right here. Little pin right here, you pull this cotter pin and the thing just pulls straight up and out. And that is a wet connection, it is a pressure sensor. It is um, mounted in a vertical position, which is good. So if you do get debris, you know, thread sealant, whatever, um, it's less likely to clog up in this because it's in a vertical position. That being said, Totally seen stuff in there, clogged in there, new installs. But um, being in a horizontal position, it is much less likely to accumulate inside our pressure sensor. Then we have our circulator pump, Grunfist 1578, three speed. You'll get it from the factory, it'll be on three speed. Leave it on there. Um, it's in a no heat call. If you need to get by and change the pump, a 1558 will work. So if you gotta throw one in, you can use one of those, but it would definitely come back and put the appropriate 1578 back in here. Um, working down on the return side, the flashlight in here, we have, have our flow sensor, which is this guy right down here. So we have a wire lead on it. And we have a little C clip. You pull that C clip up, and our flow sensor pulls right out of there. So I'll show you what that looks like. This is the flow sensor. You'll take it, pull it straight out. Wiring connections right here. And this is the flow wheel. Okay. So this will just move, there's no screens in there. Two little magnets on here. they will move against the control inside and that's what will give us our flow rate. And we'll be able to see that flow rate in live time on the control as well. So if you're trying to diagnose a uh, no domestic call, um, this will give you some info as well on it. Um, one thing to note, seen a couple of times on the incoming, debris get caught up in here and stick this wheel. So, if you do have a new install, you're getting no flow, but you're getting water through it, check and make sure you don't get any debris in there hitting this flow wheel, sticking it up. Any questions? You good? Yeah, Josh, we had one that uh, came through from Richard Scott. I'm just gonna read this one as he's got it written here. Um, from our experience on service and setup, we see, sorry, we, we regularly see close to a two inch water column drop when testing at the gas valve. This is even with an indoor regulator being installed at the unit. We have verified pipe sizing to be more than adequate. Is this something that is normal to be seen on these negative pressure gas valves? We don't want to see more than a one inch pressure drop. So that two inch pressure drop is not good. Yeah. It's not going to cause really a big issue on the, you know, today, but down the road, we could see issues with it um, having some poor combustion and dirty igniters. So, so my question would be on that is are you running CSST and how far is your regulator from the boiler? Yeah, um, Richard, I don't know, maybe uh, a little bit later on when we take a break, maybe you want to unmute yourself and we can actually have this as a conversation and see exactly what's kind of going on because Josh is 100% right. We don't want to see any more than a one inch and we also don't want to see any problems long term down the road. So um, maybe we'll just uh, come back to you during the first break and we can get something figured out. He said that okay, it's black so iron right now, less than five feet. Black iron's great. That's awesome. Um, I mean, you could use the CSST, but you're going to have to increase that quite a bit because of the restriction. And I'm not 100% against CSST. I used to rep a line, um, but it's it has its issues. Um, but five feet regulator, too close. That's probably the problem. I would want at least 10 feet between the regulator and the boiler. So if you are, you know, I know I understand in some circumstances, you can't 
to get that 10 feet. It's real tough. There's issues on jobs. Um, then you're going to want to go ahead and oversize that gas line and go extra heavy with it to give yourself volume because you don't have a pressure issue, you have a volume issue. You're dropping too much. So if you can give yourself at least 10 feet, um, that usually gives you enough and you can size that gas line accordingly. <coughs> so <clears throat> hopefully that answers, but yeah, two inches, not too much of a drop. One inch is what we want to see. I mean, if it's one inch, you know, one and a half maybe, but. He said, Richard, I think there's more going on here. And I'm, like I said, we're happy to uh, have this conversation a bit uh, further on down the break, but we'll definitely circle back to you if that's okay. Yeah, and it, we can, I mean, after the today, you can call me. Be more yep. than happy to go over anything, you know, when it comes to gas size piping. We do have a natural gas size piping chart in the book for black iron. Um, so that kind of gives you guys a little bit of help, but the code book definitely refer to that um, because we see this problem a lot with CSST. Had one last night where they're dropping five inches. So we want to watch out for that on the gas valve. Um, going down to the flow sensor, we looked at that. <clears throat> Get my little flashlight here. All right, so this is the combi. So, so in the back there, you can see, uh, we got a little condensate trap. That's right back there. All right, connects to the nipple and the condensate drain pan. And then there is access in a cover right up there where you can access the condensate trap, push it up through so you don't have to finagle it all the way through this piping. So it makes it a little bit easy. And then we have a tube that comes down into our condensate neutralizer. And I hope everybody is using neutralizers. Um, so that a job today where I don't see you guys using them, especially if you're going in septic tanks. If you're going into drain lines and they have any cast iron drains out in the street, it will eat through it. Um, I've seen it. Septic tanks, <clears throat> it will kill the good bacteria. So some guys just like dumping this in septic tanks. Yeah, the tank is concrete or poly, which probably won't affect it too much, but it will affect, um, if there's enough, the leach field, and it will kill the good, the good bacteria in that tank. So make sure even on, on uh, septic systems, you're using a condensate neutralizer and that the pellets are changed out every year and serviced, and that your trap is cleaned as well too. Then while we're on that condensate trap, take a look at it, because this is a call I get once in a while. So you'll get the trap, all right? And there'll be a piece of a tape right here holding the ball inside that, that trap, all right? So when you go to install it, you'll pull the compression nut off, and you'll pull the tape off and the ball will be just floating in there. But the cap is what I wanna look at. So on this cap, we have a metal washer and two rubber gaskets. I've seen guys on jobs think that these two rubber gaskets, one's a backup. And they take this rubber gasket they put it off to the side and they put this back together. The metal washer goes on the top. That allows us to spin this without binding up our rubber. All right, it keeps it stationary. But I've seen guys do that, only use the one gasket. This will leak if you use the one gasket. So make sure, keep both those rubber gaskets in there, put it back on, slide this up onto the condensate trap uh, condensate nipple coming out of the pan and then you screw this on and tighten this down. Obviously the tape will be removed. Okay. And then your tubing will come out this side. Same thing. But in this one, there's just one rubber gasket. Okay. That's one thing to note in the condensate trap that I get calls on once in a while. So that's the combi with the condensate trap. The other thing I want to hit on this condensate trap is located inside the unit, but on our heat only boilers currently, our condensate trap is outside the unit, as you can see right here. 
bear with me. I got cameras everywhere and boilers and wires. So one thing to note is that the condensate drip pan, so this is right up against the pan here, within like an inch or two. The nipple for the condensate pan protrudes outside of the jacket. So this is the condensate pan right here. You'll have this nipple right here. The jacket will be about right here. When you get a heating only boiler, open up the box, it'll be laying on its back, put your bracket on the wall, take that boiler from the box to the wall. Try not to set it down. You can set it down carefully, but I've seen guys slam it down or drop it and they'll hit the ground with this and crack this nipple up into the pan. I've seen it happen twice. Um, it is pretty tough, but if you drop it hard enough, you can break that. On the next series of boilers, we're all gonna have the system pumps. So that all those condensate traps will be located inside the cabinet. So this being an issue won't be an issue on the next series of boilers. But just be mindful if you're doing the heating only boilers, you just watch out for this nipple so you don't crack it because then you'll have a leak and you'll call us and you'll need a new pan. And it's fairly easy to swap out, but if you don't have to, you don't want to. All right. So then going into our flat plate heat exchanger, which is located in the back here. So we use a pretty generous flat plate heat exchanger for surface area <coughs> to gain our uh, domestic outputs. One thing to note, and you could kind of say like, this is a sales pitch, but really it's an efficiency thing, is that we're running about 160 degree water. So we're pretty close to condensing and we're running in the 90% efficiency on our domestic water production. Opposed to some manufacturers that are up in the 180s, they're actually running about 88% efficient on their domestic. So we're getting that high output on our domestic and we're still achieving 90% efficiency on the output, which is really nice. On the flat plate, there are two T20 torque screws that remove it. So you can absolutely put uh, blow down drain valves to flush out the flat plate heat exchanger. But we do have a lot of contractors if the thing does plug up that will just swap out the heat exchanger, put a new one in. Um, with labor rates and time, it's actually cheaper in a lot of cases. So all you're gonna do to swap that out is you have a screw right here and you get a screw on the other side. You'll just loosen those up. And this flat plate heat exchanger, you just take and it pulls straight out. So there's no reason you need to pull out the control, solenoid or any of that piping to get that flat plate heat exchanger out. You can do it with just removing those two screws. On our <clears throat> supply side for the combis, we have our solenoid valve, which diverts our supply water to our heating system out to our supply, or it diverts it into the flat plate heat exchanger back up into the return into the boiler. And that's our solenoid valve. The solenoid valve, This is what it looks like completely removed. You have your electrical connections right here. You'll have a clip that holds the, this will be threaded in and this will be, all be a wet connection from this point on. And this is all dry, exposed. So to remove your solenoid, you'll just take a screwdriver, pop it in here, pop this in here, pop that clip, and then you'll be able to remove solenoid valve from the unit. And that's a dry connection so for you to swap out. So this clip, the things to note, it's got two little plastic clip things that lock into here. If you're removing it and you accidentally or you really torque on this and you break these, don't worry about it because if you're replacing the solenoid, it comes with new clips. So you'll have those. So if you end up damaging this or breaking it, you get it with the replacement solenoid valve. Yeah. 
Hey, Josh. Yes, we're working on it. The domestic research. Right now, we don't have that domestic research capability built in, but um, I believe on the second series boilers, that's something that we're going to make sure we have. <clears throat> was that the question? No, no, I was going to say uh, we should take oh. a quick five, 10 minute break. Oh, yeah. We'll take a break? Yeah, let's take, uh, let's take 10 minutes and uh, we'll come back on in 10 and continue. All right, 130. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Back at 1.30, everyone can go and take a uh, washroom break or get a cup of coffee, do whatever makes you happy. Um, Richard, we have not forgotten about your question. We've got that written down. We're going to be addressing that uh, as soon as we can. And Dave Gardner, we see, I, I noticed that Josh answered your question just before we uh, hopped off. Um, I'll be here for the 10 minutes. So if anything pops up, you want to chat, feel free. Yeah, camera. I think I saw a Kevin Key or Midwest guy on here. Yeah, Should've Kevin's had... been uh, popping in a couple couple times to answer some questions for us. Should have had him fly out here to Boston and hold my camera. We asked him. He said he was afraid of planes. I don't know. This Kevin guy yeah. I can't be trusted. He's got the expense count for it. <laughs> My phone is blowing up there. I added a bunch of uh, commentary on one of the questions regarding that low water cutoff. Um, yeah. But we can touch base with TSSA on it just to make sure we're all interpreting it the same. Yeah. Uh, we are approved in many applications, but there's certainly some gray area where we would need to add. So, yeah, the way the yeah. code is written is kind of a little ambiguous here for Ontario, as far as I'm concerned, anyway, which is why I mentioned a lot of it has to do with what the uh, your local inspector will allow, for lack of a better term. Yeah, it was similar in the. Uh, in the Midwest, they had it in certain regions where basically as long as you were under 400, they they really didn't care about any of the stipulations written into it. But there was other areas where they were really picky about some of those little eh, maybes and odds and ends that they like to uh, to pick out. So certainly it's not a bad idea to have another one in there, but ours works in many applications. Yeah, I mean, for what it's worth, I haven't had any inspectors give me any grief on an external low water cutoff in, it's been over seven years since I've had my last call about that. Now you're just dating yourself. Hey, I am super old. I am 40 now. You seen the glasses that I wear? Hold on. Turns out. You haven't seen them either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. There. Now, better? Am I old enough now? Yeah. Look really smart. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate that. <laughs> Robert Belanger, Tri Sudbury. Is that with regards to the inspectors and low water yeah, cutoffs? Yeah. Is that what you're is that what you're mentioning? Yeah. So we yeah. may have a we may have an inspector there that is uh, pickier on it. So it uh, I'll, I'll I'll touch base with with Bob on it to see if there's uh, there's somebody we can talk to out there specifically. Hundred uh, percent. Like when when the last time that I came across this was a like I said it was a couple of years ago. Not gonna lie, because as I mentioned, old glasses. We all all saw that. Um, Usually a conversation or a day spent with, not a day, like a, a meeting with the inspector to kind of go over how it works usually is enough to kind of get us over that hurdle. But uh, uh, hey, you know, whatever we got to do to help you make it right over there or to just kind of give you the best information that we can. Um, that's why we mentioned it is, it's different as you move from east to west across the country. Yeah. Yeah, somebody noted in the chat somewhere they require a probe type so yeah yeah dave demerch um i'm not sure if i got your whole last name in there sorry with that but whereabouts is it where it has to be the probe type dave demerchant 
I'm curious. Yeah, I used to have one inspector in one small region that had a specific requirement. Yeah. Again, that uh, they're mentioning that is Sudbury, Ontario. Come on, Sudbury. <laughs> Got your work cut out for you. I know that's a, that's okay. We just need to make sure we know what we have to do, and then we can follow all the rules. What I would say, um, though, is if you not if you, we are happy to speak to those inspectors. Like absolutely, that's our job all day, every day. If you want to send us their info, we can make those calls and get in front of them, and either make the argument for, or they can throw us out of their office with their argument against. Um, that's really the only two options that they're going to have. And that's what we get paid to do is get, uh, get in front of those folks and give them the information. So let us know how we can help to take that pain away. And with that, Josh, whenever you're ready, my friend, the floor is yours once more. Okay. So going back where we dropped off, the three-way valve or diverting valve. Um, <clears throat> again, this is your solenoid. So this is the wet connection. This part right here, brass body will be threaded into the main body. Gasket right here. And then this guy will just move up and down and divert that water. So one thing to note we've seen is debris from construction getting caught up in here and causing resistance. And then this solenoid pulling away and breaking from the plunger. So if you do have that, you get that call and this thing is broken away from it, you're gonna to wanna to go ahead and open this and see if you got any debris lodged up in here preventing this thing to move freely, okay? Um, that's one thing to note on the service side. Happen, ha hasn't happened too much, um, but it has happened a couple times on a couple of calls that I've seen. But that's how you service it, remedy it. Um, what other things on the three-way valve? Oh, okay. So that three-way valve too. Um, one thing to note with the troubleshooting and setup is your three-way valve diverts your supply water to the system or to the heat exchanger. And when it does that, it cuts the system off thermally to your thermal expansion. So it is important if you are doing a combi, to make sure you don't have a check valve on the return boiler piping. So if you have a check valve going towards the boiler on the return piping and you go into domestic, your boiler is then completely cut off from any thermal expansion. So there's no need for it, but we, there's no reason to put a check valve on the boiler return line going into it. So that's just one thing to note. Gotten that call a couple times. Hate to have you guys have to put one in and then cut it out. So on the combis, no check valves on the return lines. Keep that open. That way the system, when it's in domestic, has thermal expansion all the way through it. Okay. Then down in here, the last thing, is we have our 12K sensor for the domestic hot water, and that is coated purple. Okay. Then let's get into some of the wiring. Let's see if I can get the camera focused and see this. Can you read the terminals? Yep. Yes, we can. All right. So this is our low voltage connection. And I'm just going to kill power of the boiler quick. Only electrocuted. So this is our low voltage connections right here on all our boilers. One thing to note with our low voltage connections is that these green terminals, you can pull straight out and pull down. 
So that just makes it a little bit easier for wiring in the field. All right, just make sure you got them seated all the way in there. That way you don't have no heat call or an issue with the, the calling. So the first set of terminals working over here from the right, you have one, two, three, the Modbus, this connection right here. This could be a commercial Modbus connection, or we're using it on this application for that add-on Wi-Fi module. One, two, three. Then we have our domestic hot water connection. So if we're using a combi, this is already gonna be field wired, all right? If we have a heat only, this won't be. We won't have anything in here. And this is where we either run um, an Aquastat, so our Honeywell L4006, I think it is, um, Aquastat, or we could run the 12K sensor that comes with the boiler. And then that will be our tank sensor. The one thing to note in that is when you go to set up your domestic, if you're using an indirect, it's gonna ask you the first question, thermostat or sensor? Use the aquastat, select the thermostat. If you're using the sensor, select the sensor. So if you don't select that right, you can have issues with the domestic. So just make sure that's set correctly. Next one is our outdoor sensor. I put a, the actual outdoor sensor in here for training purposes. But again, <coughs> it's gonna be this module right here that you're gonna mount outside. The outdoor sensor does come with a little metal bracket that goes along back here. It actually stands the outdoor sensor so it's actually off the wall. So this outdoor sensor doesn't actually mount right up against the wall. It sets it off about three quarters of an inch. That way you get good airflow around here and you can get a true temperature on the outside. When we go through the outdoor reset, you'll see that that the outdoor sensor, that outdoor temperature is important to make sure this boiler is finding out the correct temperature for design. So the outdoor sensor for most applications, we're gonna need that mounted on the north wall. We want it away from the sun. That sun can throw it off pretty drastically. And if we throw it off, the boiler thinks it's warmer than it is and runs cooler. And then we have a uh, call from Miss Smith saying, the thermostat's set at 72 and it's 69 or 70. My house isn't heating. And then you go back and what do you do? Most contractors just unplug it and call it a day. So making sure that outdoor sensor is installed out of the sun properly is good. Also, making sure that it's far enough away from bath fan, uh, bath fan exhausts, because that can throw it off. Make sure it's away from dryer vents as well. And then make sure it's away from the exhaust of the boiler. That's probably the most common problem I see is because everything is just in that area. You, you run your intake out, you run your exhaust out, and your outdoor sensor usually goes right there because that's the easy place to put it. That exhaust will throw this thing off 20 degrees easy. I've seen it, saw it the other day. Um, so make sure that outdoor sensor is placed somewhere appropriately so you can read that outdoor temperature. And that's the outdoor sensor right there. Next one is CH1. So CH1, CH2, that's central heating one. So this, if we were running two zones, I can do that out of this boiler. <coughs> I can run my thermostat right into CH1. All right, two wires, not three, don't have a common. So you gotta use that common maker or you gotta pull in a separate transformer into that thermostat and go to RC and C and pull the jumper between RH and RC. And you can power it that way. But just note, it's only two wires, red and white coming out for CH1. Then our mod signal. So if you're using auxiliary modulation control, that will be connected into right here. And the next one is system sensor. Now, the sensor that comes with the boiler that is that indirect sensor, that can also be used as a system sensor. The system sensor is only being used if we're doing a cascading system. A cascading system requires a system sensor on uh, the outlet of the secondary side on the supply, just as you're coming out of either the closely spaced heat or out of the low loss header. And 
I've seen a lot of guys, most guys just do the strap on or just strap it on with zip ties. Um, occasionally I see some systems overshoot. So my recommendation on that is if you're doing cascading or using your system sensor, I highly recommend using an immersion well and getting it into the stream of water. If you do that, you get a much more accurate temperature and it pretty much prevents overshooting with that unit. There are ways we can go into the control and slow the unit down and prevent overshooting. But if you can get an immersion well and a T into the outlet side on that, it will prevent that from, from happening in pretty much all the installations that we've had. Then the last one is CH2. That again is a CH2, the central heating two second zone thermostat will be connected right there. Okay. Also in this control panel, we have the connection right here for the cascading cable. So this will go to the next boiler, to the next boiler, but that's where that cascade cable plugs in. Then we have a top here. Just take this off. Three fuses, 2.5 amp fuses right here. These are for our relay contacts. Then we have our connection for our fan gas valves, pumps, high voltage up in here. And then all our communication and sensors are on this side. The board, if you have to change it, it's pretty easy. So you just unplug all your connections. And then there's a little clip tab right here holding it in. You just move that over and the whole board just pulls right out. Put the new one in, put all your connections on, and you're done. Also, the control swings out for service. So it makes it easy to get in here if you got to get into the cabinet, clean the heat exchanger, whatever. Um, cleaning the heat exchanger, we're running water and solutions. Put this thing out of the way so you don't get any water on it. I did have a contractor call me and said he had an issue. I asked him if he got some water on the board. He said a little, I said it was shot. And he says, oh, in that case, no, I didn't get any water. Well, he didn't swing it out. So make sure you swing this panel out so you can get it out of the way so you don't get water on it. There is a cover that goes onto it to protect it, but you have this able to swing out. When you're wiring on your low voltage connections, all right, you're running a wire up and your lead length's on here. When you go to get your length of wire, move the control out. <coughs> then get your length of wire and cut it. I'll see you guys wire the control board up just like this. And it will be so tight in here with the wiring that they won't be able to swing this panel out. So if you swing it out and wire it, you know you'll have enough lead length to swing the control out. And then going to the low water cutoff that you guys want to tie in auxiliary, the probe type, we have connections right here where those will wire into. I think it's on the watchdogs. There's a brand of low water cutoff that has a Molex plug and it matches up to this on this side. Guys have plugged it in there. Doesn't go there. Control will go dead. It won't kill it, it won't break it, but the screen will go off and then we'll get a call that there's no heat and we can't get control on because they installed their low water cutoff up here and they plugged it in here and it rendered the control useless. So just note the low water cutoffs wire into these two connections. Then on the high voltage, uh, this is one of the older models we have in here some of the earlier models, I'd say. This is all the high voltage connections. So we have our power in right here. We have a terminal that's called flame. We have a terminal for CH1 pump. We have a terminal for DHW pump. And we have a terminal up here for 120 volts if we want it for like an outlet. So this is an older model. Um, the newer models are a little bit different. We have a couple more, we have one more pump output. And yeah, I'll show you this one. Pretty much all our models now and all the floor boilers.
have your power supply in, they have CH1 pump, boiler pump, DHW pump, and CH2 pump. So we have all the true labeling. The flame connection threw everybody off. But essentially that was your CH1 pump and the CH1 pump was being used as a DA, um, your boiler pump. So now we have those two terminals in there that make sense. And we also have the CH2 pump installed. So out of the boiler and all our new boilers, you can run two zones of heat, the system circs, your boiler pump and a DHW pump right out of the box. If you're doing zone valves, you'll either have to add a relay or use a ZVC control to tie those in. Because we can only send out 120 volts. We don't send, you don't have an option for 24 volts there for your zone valves. And that is the line voltage connection. Wiring the boiler, um, make sure you have the correct polarity. Hot coming in goes to L, neutral goes to neutral and your ground goes to ground. Also make sure you have a good ground back to your panel. That's gonna keep your ignition consistent and re reduce any issues with flame failures or failed ignition. So make sure your, um, your wiring is good there back to the panel on ground. Um, so, and then you have your control max control on the front and then your water connections below. We'll have down here, you have one inch connections coming off your boiler supplies, three quarters coming off your domestic connections and three quarter coming off for your gas. You'll have electrical connections up in here and then we'll have you some rubber grommets that will come through here where you can run your low voltage wiring as well. And that's pretty much what the bottom connections look like on the wall boilers. This one you can see we're using one of those Kalefi crossover mixing valves. And then we have our flush valves up in here. So <coughs> if you can run a mixing valve, it's great. It's just gonna give us a little bit more output or the homeowner more output. It's also gonna help keep that flow nice and consistent. Our boilers on the domestic side and the combis coming out, it is steady. Um, I won't say it fluctuates, but having this mixing valve in here just alleviates any issues if there are pressure issues or water quality issues in that house. Uh, they work great. Also, they're a good protection for kids if there is an issue. Um, I think that's pretty much it on the layout of the wall boiler. I'll take you over. This is the floor boiler. So again, working from the top, we have our inlet, our vent. <coughs> when you get this boiler, there'll be a screw here and a screw right here that's holding down the top access panel cover. This cover does flip up, okay? So these screws, you can put them back in, you can leave them, you can throw them away. Not a big deal. We don't require you leave them in after the install. I think more or less it's for shipping just to keep this control nice and snug. So you'll have those two. So just note, try to open this up. You get those screws in there. This cover will not lift up if those screws are still in there. Our domestic connections are labeled, supply, inlet, and the pressure reducing valve back here. On the front control of this boiler, we actually have our power switch. We have that Wi-Fi control that's right in here. Real simple, power, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and then a reset, and then your main button. Control, max cut, control. And this one, we came off this side with our gas. 
you can see it's just knocked out for right there. And then we have our water feed connection coming into the lower port. So the low loss header would go on this side. And then we have a bleed screw right here. Condensate plugged in with a 120 outlet. And then the condensate drain comes out right down here. And if we go to the other side, pretty much the same thing. The gas connection we can use right here. That's where that would come out. Our low loss header bolted right on. And then our condensate trap out here coming out right here. Um, one thing to note, the one inch will bolt directly on here to the 110 and 155. If we're using the 199, there's gonna be some offset adapters because the 199 low loss header is a lot bigger than this one. It's taller, spaced out differently. So there'll be offset adapters. That low loss header on the inch and a quarter will actually probably stick out about right here. So you'll have a little bit more room out there that you'll have to watch out for. So internally, look in here, it's pretty much the same boiler. Same heat exchanger, same parts. We have our flu sensor back here, supply temp sensor, return low water cutoff pump, all the domestic connections are the same, except we don't have the control max here, line voltage connections, board. So the parts are interchangeable, except a few. One, the control, it's built into this top. So if you need to replace this control, you will get this whole top panel, less the Wi-Fi control. You can pop this out, and then put it into the new one. But if you have to place the display control, it's this whole top cover. And the new ones are white. This was an early model that was black that we got, um, but the boilers that you guys will get, this whole cover is white. Then your ignition lead. Um, one thing we changed is on the floor boilers, we moved our ignition transformer from up here down to underneath our gas valve. So this ignition lead is shorter on this one. So that's different. Same igniter, same ignition module, same gas valve, same boards, same flat plate, same pump, all those components are the same. So if you purchase one of the service kits, you essentially have everything for this floor boiler. Same fans, um, you just have the different wiring leads and different control display. Also with this floor boiler, one thing to note during the install, this looks like a great workstation. We include in the box cardboard. And on that cardboard, labeled 155 and 199, we give you a top piece you can cut out and put over this boiler for a workstation. You can work on that and not worry about scratching it up and scratching that control and display. So if you're in the floor boilers, please use this. That'll keep everything nice and clean for you. And then just take it, you're done, toss it. Um, then on the bottom, like I said earlier, we have our water connections down here and there's drain points underneath there. Condensate traps located inside the unit. Um, other than that, it's pretty much the same thing. That's the floor boiler. Not much else is different. Same setups and everything that we, we do on the wall boilers. Um, same combustion specs, except with this one. You know, as you can see, we're just coming off, going in our supply, coming back with a return. So all our primary piping is done. So our hydraulic separation, air separation, dirt separation is completed out of the box. So yeah, you'll pay a little bit more for this boiler up front, but you'll save a bunch of money in the labor and the piping and the materials because it's already finished. So um, that's a beautiful low loss header. Yeah, I like the green. The green's nice. Love the cleffy. Yep. So um, real easy. Simple install. Put it on the floor. The feet too. 
Uh, as you can see it, they're rubber and they are leveling feet. So if you need to level off the boiler, you 100% can do that. Josh, inside yeah. the boiler, can you show the internal piping for the alternate left-hand connections? Um, no, I can't. And that is because if you look, this cavity behind here yep. is open right here. The back of the boilers are right there. There's an open cavity here where that piping is. It just comes up from the bottom, circles up, and then tees off this way and tees the other way. So you okay. can't actually see that piping back there. That's the back, but that's the other side. Was the connection. That all being said is even on the wall boilers, I didn't hit on this, but our side panels, our top panels, the back panel are all removable. So if you need to gain access to any of this stuff, just pop a screw here, pop a screw there, a couple on the bottom, this whole side panel comes off. Um, so for in, if you needed to get access to the heat exchanger, you wanted more room, um, there is a skeleton here that kind of holds it all together. And these side panels and top panels can remove for service. Um, I don't know why you'd really need to, because everything's pretty easy to come out the front, but we give you the option if you want to take off those side panels, you can. Uh, yeah. So that is the floor boiler. Um, what next? Do we want to get into setup commissioning? Is that a good place to start? This is a great place to uh, start that, yeah. Okay. Unless we have any questions on that floor unit. No questions came through that we didn't uh, address and answer, I believe. Um, I know there was a couple of them coming through kind of fast and furious. So if there was any questions on that floor mount uh, that we didn't get to, please just uh, put it back in the chat and I, I assure you we will we will get to them. Other than that, yeah, we're going to move on to commissioning. Okay. Yeah, so let's do this first. I'm going to go through the control because we're going to need it for the setup. So let's go for the control first. Give me a second to set up this camera so you guys can see it. All right. So <clears throat> you're gonna turn the boiler on. This is gonna be what we call the home screen. All right, so we're gonna to refer to that. So there's some information on here that we can look at right from our home screen. So we're gonna be able to find out, you know, what we have for a boiler. So up to the top here, we got combi. Down below is the status. So right now it's in standby. It's waiting to do something. It's waiting for a call. Then we have a picture of the boiler, the fan. When it starts running, we'll see a flame come down here. Our supply temperature out right here and a return temperature back here. On this side of the screen will be our call for heating, for central heating. And on this side of the screen right here will be our call for domestic right down here. Now below here, there's some information we give you. And if you hit the left and right arrow buttons, you can toggle through some quick info. So just from the home screen. So you can look at the outdoor temperature, 76, which that sensor is in the room right now. So don't, that's not accurate. Your system sensor. So if we were using that system sensor for the uh, cascading, that's where that would be listed. The mix zone, if we were doing a mix zone, we're using that system sensor to sense that, that's where that would be shown. Our domestic flow. So we were running domestic. We can see that in live time. The target temp. So if you're we calling for heating, our target would be listed there. If we are running a thermostat and set point only, and you had it at 180, it would just show 180. If we were using the outdoor sensor and we were doing outdoor reset, whatever our curve was, that would be your target there. And then it shows again the supply system and return sensors. And then your domestic sensor, which is the sensor and the domestic output. 
that's some quick information right there that you can look at. Um, so the basic info to go into and do the easy setup, you're just gonna press the center circle button on the control once, and that's gonna get into the, the basic functions I like to call it. So the top left, you'll have easy setup. The right, you'll have CH and DHW operation. Lower right, you'll have the select language, which is you know English, French, German, whatever. And then your boiler information. So we'll start up here at your CH DHW operation. This just allows you to turn the space heating off and your domestic off. So if you were doing something, you didn't want the boiler to come on and run, you could turn those off. Or if you had a combi, you want to turn the domestic off so it doesn't come on, you could do that. So this just gives you a quick reference to turn those things on and off. And then if you always go back to down here in the lower left, you can always go to the back to the home screen. And then this little arrow right here just takes you back one screen. Then going down here, your boiler information. This shows you your boiler info and shows your lockout history. So if we go to boiler info, it's gonna tell us the status. So we're in standby now, the heating call, DHW call, firing rate, ionization current, you see that in live time while we're running, your boiler set point, supply temp, return temp, flue temp, outdoor temp, DHW temp, certain modulation signal, and water pressure, and ignition, and run time. So just all that information is basically in the screen. Can't adjust anything, it's just the info. So back one screen, we'll get the lockout history. So we'll be able to go in and see the last eight lockouts. So it doesn't give us like a whole list of 500 lockouts if we've had a bunch of issues. It just gives us our last eight. Although on the um, floor boiler with the app, when you have the Wi-Fi, you can look at all those saved lockouts. It will log it in that um, control. Click on it. Sometimes too, it will save information. You can look at the lockout details, what was going on. That is the boiler info. Now the easy setup. So this easy setup is good. It gives you for a quick setup if you're doing just thermostat and set point and not doing the curve. But for most cases, I'm still gonna recommend that you guys adjust the curve in the back end of the control, the installer settings, we'll call it. So the easy setup, you'll click onto that and you'll have the heating easy setup, DHW easy setup, your settings. So you can just look at what, you know, what is what, not control or change anything. <coughs> and then your reset for the easy setup. So we start at heating easy setup. We have, the therm, we, have the, we have the outdoor sensor installed. So we have options here for thermostat and outdoor curve, constant and outdoor curve, constant and set point, and zero to 10 modulation. Zero to 10 modulation is we have up on our low voltage connection, the modulation signal, we'll click that and that's it. You'll set up everything up in your auxiliary control. That's all you need to do if you're gonna be using modulation. The thermostat and outdoor curve, that means the system is gonna sit cold until a thermostat calls, and then it's gonna target whatever our curve design is. Constant and outdoor curve means this boiler 24 seven, 365 is gonna run at whatever our target on our outdoor curve is. So where you'd use this, I don't know if you guys are doing constant circ, but Europe is big. Um, if you're using like panel radiators with TRV vests and you design it with a temp and an outdoor curve, the thing just runs constantly. And as it calls for heat, it opens up the TRVs and they send heat to the radiators. So that's kind of where you'd use that. And then constant and set point, this thing would be running just like an oil boiler. It's just gonna, you say if your set point's 180, this thing is just gonna target 180 all day. 
So occasionally I get a call saying the boiler won't shut off. I got no thermostats on there. I got no calls. My boiler is just running. It's calling because they have it set on constant and set point. I get that call once in a while for service. So double check and make sure that that's not set if it's continuously calling. Um, if I unplug the outdoor sensor, I'm not gonna do it, but if I unplug it, <clears throat> you'll see the options for outdoor curve go away. And all you'll have is thermostat set point, constant set point, and zero to 10 modulation. So you'll lose those outdoor curve settings. As Soon as it senses the outdoor sensor, it automatically pops up your curve options. So most of your applications are gonna be thermostat and outdoor curve. We go ahead and click that. The first thing it's gonna have is select CH1 outdoor curve. That's gonna be in the top. And then we're gonna show a graph. So this is nice because it shows us what the outdoor reset is, is set for, where a curve is. Now, this is where a lot of guys get confused and we have a lot of issues. So we made these preset outdoor curves to make it a little bit easier. But in most cases, I want to adjust a few of these temperatures in the back end. <laughs> we have some quick ones in here. So this is the current setting. So what this is saying is that my warm design is 64 degrees outside. My cold design is 10 degrees. The coolest my boiler will run is 140. And the hottest my boiler will run is 180. So when it is 10 degrees outside, my boiler will get at full potential at 180. As it gets warmer outside, my boiler temp drops. So it might be, let's say 30 degrees, and I might be running at like 168, 165. Okay. And then it gets down to 140. So this outdoor reset on all of our outdoor resets, you know, whether it's us, Taco, Techmar, doesn't care about the boiler. Your outdoor curve and your outdoor reset is determined by the radiation in the house. That's what you need to know and that's what you need to have for information on setting your outdoor curve. This is, outdoor reset is just to save you a few bucks or save the homeowner a few bucks in the shoulder season, all right? To reduce that temperature because we technically don't need 180 degrees when it's 40 or 50 degrees out depending on the system. So if you go and use the up and down arrows, you can see we change to some different options. So it starts off with floor heating low temp, which is 10 degrees and 64 and 96 and 76, all right? So this would be like uh, maybe in the slab or a quick track on top of the floor, a little higher. 104 and 76. Radiator, so maybe a cast iron radiator, panel radiator, if it was sized, you know, designed properly, 120, 120 on the high, 80 on the low, 10 degrees for the outdoor design. Um, radiators two, goes up to 140. Radiators three, up to 158. Four, 176 to 80, that's a huge curve right there. That's a big curve. Radiators five, 186 to 80. Then we get a cast iron baseboard. Our low temp comes up to 100. Fin tube baseboard, 120 to 180. And then radiators and fan coil. But I'm gonna go back to this one, fin tube baseboard. Got a lot of guys that set this. Most installs that we have is fin tube baseboard probably the majority of the installs that we see. This curve doesn't meet a lot of our demand for what we have in our market. So number one, the 10 degree design, that means that 180 degrees, this thing will be running at full potential, 180 at 10 degrees outside. Most houses I can say in New England, when they designed them and laid out the baseboard in the house, they put just enough baseboard, 540 BTUs per foot, into that house to heat it. They put the minimal amount, all right? They didn't put extra, but the minimal amount. So when we look at these curves and we set it, we, you know, we wanna to try to cool it down, but if you go up in the house, there's a good chance they got furniture in front of half the baseboard for a good chunk of it. So every foot is 540 BTUs. We gotta take that out of the equation. So we can't drop too much. 
on most applications. So guys that use this, we find that the high is good 180, but our low at 120, we're not heating that house effectively. And we got to bring that 120 up. <coughs> so <clears throat> this is good as a quick setup, but again, that's why we want to go in the back end of the control. And I want to adjust this. I would go in, if I'm going into just a regular ranch, they got baseboard in there. They got a bunch of furniture, couches and beds and bureaus in front of the stuff. I'm going to go in there. I'm going to leave my high temp at 180, but I'm going to take my 120 low and I'm probably going to bump that up to like 160, maybe even 170 if there's a lot of furniture. Um, and also I'm going to take my 10 degree temperature, cold weather design, and I'm going to take that from 10 degrees and I'm going to adjust that to 30. That means that when it gets 30 degrees outside, I'm running at full potential opposed to 10. So if I have a 160 to 180 curve and it's at 10 degrees, when I'm at 30, I might be running at like 170. So we're not, we want to have a heating curve where we're saving some money, but not to the point where the homeowners, homeowner notices a lack of heat. And that's where we got to find that balance. If you're doing radiant, most times you're going to be using a loop cat or a system design. And you're going to have those temperatures that you can dial this thing into. But on baseboard, you got to go up and count it. And you got to kind of figure it out on your own as a technician and see kind of where you're at. So that's kind of the easy setup and some of the controls. And so we're just going to pick the Fin2 baseboard for now. And then when we get into the back end, the installer settings, I'll show you guys how to change it. So CH1 will be the first option. We click OK in the Fin2. We'll get into CH2. So I can run two curves. So if I want to run this with radiant and baseboard, um, my CH1 is you know, going up to 180, but my CH2, we're gonna do low temp floor heat, which we can do, all right? The one thing we need to protect though is that low temp. So if my CH2 calls, it's only gonna go and satisfy this curve. But while CH2 is running, if my CH1 kicks in, boom, I'm going to that hotter curve. It's going to ramp up. And then I'm spending 180 degree water through my radiant. And that's when we have cracked floors, cracked tile, and all that. So if you have those two differential temperatures, you need to install some sort of mixing, whether it's a static, you know, Honeywell AMX series mixing valve or Tecmar, whatever to protect that low temperature heating. You still have to do that. But if you're, you know, a fan coil and baseboard, I might not worry about it. My fan coil can handle those higher temperatures. So you just got to watch out for that. So CH2, you got your curve, you just hit the center circle button. Warm weather shutdown. Most cases you're going to leave this off. It comes from the factory off. Um, where I see this kind of most popular is with landlords and tenants. Landlord wants this on. He wants the heating system to turn off at 70 degrees outside. You know, maybe he's paying for the fuel. That's kind of where I see this used a lot. Um, or a homeowner has kids that like jacking up the thermostats in the summer, they'll use this option. But that's all the warm weather shutdown is, is you tell it at a temperature, say 70 degrees, that I want my central heating to, to shut down no matter what. Your domestic still works, it's completely independent of this. This just controls that central heating and shuts it off at a temperature outside. You also can see where these temperatures come into play with our outdoor sensor placement. That's why it's critical reading the actual accurate outdoor temperature and we're not being thrown off by exhaust or uh, the sun. So one weather shutdown, we want that off. We just hit the center circle button. Boom, done. Easy setup complete. Press the OK to go back. And that's the heating easy setup. We can go over to the domestic. Um, this is the combi, so it's going to get right into our set point. This is going to be where our thermostat, our 12K sensor coming out of the supply, what we want that set for. So I got a mixing valve in this one. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm probably going to bring this up to maybe 140, run it right there. And then I'm gonna take my mixing valve and I'm gonna bump this down to say 120, 125, depending on my install. Okay. Warm start, so I can enable this. It's gonna come from the factory off. 
But if you want this boiler to keep that flat plate hot year round, this is where you can do that. And you can keep the warm start on and keep that flat plate, say 120 or 130 and solve any issues you have with that homeowner on the delay of hot water. So, you know, most cases we go in, if they have a customer has a tank type water heater, they're used to getting that hot water instantly. But we switch over to one of these systems, we have to communicate with that homeowner that, hey, look, we're gonna be much more efficient in our domestic and we're not gonna kick on and keep the tank hot. We're only gonna kick on if there's a call. So if you don't run your domestic and you're gone for a week, it doesn't call for a week. Um, where this thing will keep it warm, this is if this homeowner is like, you know what, I'm not happy about it. I like my tank, I know you told me, I don't like it. What are our other options? Well, you can put an indirect in, or we could try using this warm start and keeping that flat plate hot and see how that works out. So we do have that flexibility of adding a warm start into this function. And then the warm start, uh, Hysterius, this is enabled if we use that warm start, this will um, keep the heat exchanger a certain temperature wherever we set it at if we're using that warm start. And then our domestic easy setup is complete. All right, now what it didn't show is that, I think maybe we can do this by pull the sensor. No, it won't let me, except for combi. So if I didn't have, this wasn't a combi and this was a heat only. The first option in this domestic easy setup would have been thermostat or sensor. And that's where we pick thermostat or sensor where we're running an aquastat or the tank sensor. So that's kind of the only difference. And then we'd set a tank that point where we want the tank set and what we want our boiler operating at. So we'd set, say I want my tank set at 140, so I'm using the sensor. And then you would tell it, okay, what boiler temperature do I want to run when that calls? Do I want to run 180, 170? So you have the flexibility to adjust that as well. And that is our basic functions on this control. So if we go back to the home screen, and you can see the adjustments, it always says loading parameters at the bottom. So we can wait that for that to load. Now we're gonna go into the installer settings. And all we're gonna do is hold the up and down arrows for about five seconds. And it's gonna ask us for installer access code. This access code on all of our boilers is 054. It's not in our manuals, but note it, 054. So from here, we have our CHDHW settings, reset all settings, cascading settings, and manual operation. So if we start in with our CHDHW settings, boiler settings, CH settings, and domestic settings. So if we go down to our boiler settings, <clears throat> this is where it's gonna show combi our ultimate lockout temp, our mod bus address, this is where we enter that, our pump settings. So if we wanna go in and we want to, for some reason, change what pumps come on when CH1 calls, this is where we go in and we can adjust that. Our ignition level, if we're having some gas issues, for venting issues we need to overcome. This is where we can kind of adjust our ignition fan speeds. 
If we're using a mixed zone, we can adjust that temperature with this. The water pressure differential trigger, there's a few settings in here that we aren't using that are in some of our boilers overseas. Again, this control is very universal in a lot of our equipment, but that WP trigger, differential trigger, we do not use, it's not active. Um, and our appliance setting, altitude. So the appliance setting, this is where we're gonna go in and we're gonna set the boiler to, to what that sticker says. So if it's a propane combi, this is where we go and adjust that. That setting. And then obviously altitude. If we need to change the altitude of where the boiler is being installed, this is where we can adjust that. And those are the boiler settings. So we get into the CH settings, our central heating settings. We have our information up top, thermostat and outdoor curve. We can go and adjust this stuff. CH max capacity. So this is gonna be coming through from us at 100%. This is where you can derate that boiler. So if you wanna drop that maximum capacity, cause you don't need all 155,000 BTUs, this is where that's done. And then the minimum capacity, if for some reason you wanted to bring it up and not have it fire at a low fire rate, you wanna bring that minimum capacity up. That's where you could adjust that. Our absolute max set point, 186. And then let me just scroll down a little bit. So this is where we can completely customize that curve. So CH1 max set point, 180. This is that curve that we set earlier. So again, like I said, if we're doing a baseboard job, I'm going to go into that CH1 min set point, And I'm going to bring that up to say 160. And then my coldest outdoor curve day, I'm going to bring that up. 30 degrees. So that's where we can adjust that there. And then if we go down, we have the CH2 settings for those temperatures. It still utilizes the same outdoor and warm weather designs that we put up in CH1, but this we just change our max set point and minimum set point. And then warm weather shutdown. Uh, our circulation pump, if we want to run permanent or only want to call, we can actually run permanent if we wanted to. Our post pump time to get that heat out of the boiler, put in our low loss header, or if you're using a buffer, get that heat out of there, maximize our efficiency, you can adjust that. Our freeze protection and frost protection come factory enabled and frost protection comes set up. Uh, our parallel shift, we're gonna have set from the factory at zero degrees. CH call blocking. If we wanna prevent this thing from short cycling, if we have small zones and one kicks on, another zone kicks on, as soon as after that one goes out, we can call block that and wait and allow it to post pump and that might get us heating or get us our heat out and allow us to get some of that heat into the system and call it and satisfy it. And your appliance CH minimum set point. Those are the heating settings. And then we can go into the domestic. This gives us a little more options. So our DHW differential, we can go ahead and adjust that. Your DHW set point, your Warm start set point, if we had that on. So okay, we're gonna turn our warm start temperature to 120. The warm start serious. Is gonna be what this the burner will stay at this degree. when the temperature's satisfied. Okay. Let's turn this 
exhausted, isn't it, Lord? DHW post pump time, priority, timeout. So we can turn that off. So if you're indirect calling for long periods of time or you have, you know, teenage girls, you can have this shut down at a certain predetermined time so it doesn't call constantly and prevent the heat from kicking on. And then your DHW call blocking for, you know, uh, DHW calls if you didn't want to go back to back. And then our DHW the CH call blocking from the central heating call, the DHW call. And that's DHW settings. Then back one and the manual operation. So this is where we can go in and we can manually turn pumps on and off the fan, um, which this is where we are doing our setup. So when we go to commission the boiler, we're gonna go into this manual operation and we're going to um, click the center okay button on the fan. So where it says released, that means control of the fan is released to the boiler. As soon as you hit the center okay button, it gives you level 1%. 1% is the low firing rate. You just move over and bring it up to 100% and it'll bring me into high fire rate. Let me go into the cascade. So you'll have your cascade info. This is not set up, so there's a bunch of information that you won't see or we can connect to. Cascade settings. So you'll be able to set your stage delay your minimum firing rate, your max firing rate, how many CH central heating and DHW boilers you have, your auto rotation, your gains, proportional and integral. <coughs> Those um, on the CH and DHW, only adjust those if you call us. So if your boiler is overshooting, this is where we could go in and adjust those uh, settings to slow or increase or firing rates. But again, if you do need to do that, first thing we're going to recommend is installing your system sensor in the immersion well. And if that is, and we're still overshooting, that's when we'll go in and adjust those. Also, if we make any changes in our cascading settings, we got to go back through and auto detect. So I'm not going to hit this because it's going to go through a whole detection and it's going to take like three minutes. But um, we'd click on this right here. When we first install the cables and we get everything up and running, it'll auto detect, go out and it will detect how many boilers we have. So if we have three boilers on there, we hit the auto detect, it'll go through, look for those boilers. It will come back and say, you have three boilers installed. Is this correct? Press okay. If not, go back. So we press okay. And then from there we're connected. We can go make our setting adjustments. Once you make any setting adjustments on the cascading, you need to go back in and auto detect, and that actually saves your settings once you go through and auto detect again. And then we go back to, that's pretty much everything. Yep. All right, so that's everything with the control going over to the buttons. Again, we have that center circle okay button. You hold the two up and down arrows to get in the installer settings. And then over here, this is just a power button. Okay. And that's the control. Pretty simple, pretty easy. We have a lockout. It tells us what the lockout is in words as opposed to codes. So you don't necessarily need the manual to set that up. So what I'm gonna do now that we've seen the control and we've seen the installer settings and we've seen the manual operation, we can go ahead and fire this off and we can go through the setup. And it should work. All right, so the analyzer I'm using today is a Crocom, pretty basic analyzer, has some great features connecting to an app and downloading reports, kind of where I like to use it. Um, 
super easy to upload for the registration. So when I set up to do my commissioning, um, this analyzer actually, uh, I can use it as a manometer. So I have it up here on my incoming gas pressure port. All right. And then I have my probe up in my exhaust. So I like you doing this because everything, all our information is on one screen. I don't have a separate manometer. So it's pretty easy to do the setup. So let me grab. So we're on natural gas here. Um, so natural gas, we're looking for five, five to 13 inches water column on our gas pressure. And I'm at 6.1. Propane, you're gonna be looking at eight to 13 inches. And all this info is 100% in our manual. So if you don't remember, it's okay. Um, but those are the pressures that we need and we don't wanna drop more than one inch, okay? Um, so that's one thing we need to watch out when we get in the high fire, that we're not dropping one inch from static to high fire. Let me just escape out of here. All right, so my analyzer shows me my O2, my CO, my CO2, my ratio, which we don't use, and my gas pressure all on one screen, which is really nice. Also, by pushing one button, I can send the report to an app as opposed to using a printer. Got my probe in there, got my analyzer on. Go ahead and turn this thing on, dump some water here. All right, so I'm in the manual operation. Yeah, I'm at level 1% low fire. So I'm gonna let this thing kick off. It'll be interesting to see where this ends up because I'm sure everyone's played with these adjustments. So so I am natural gas and I am running a 155. So in our manual we have some parameters to be between. So my CO2 wants to be between nine and ten and a half. My target is nine point five. My O2 should be between 2.5, oh, sorry, 2.15 and 4.85 with a target of 3.95. And then my max CO needs to be on high fire below 10 parts per million and low fire, sorry, high fire below 150 parts per million and low fire below 10 parts per million. So right now I'm at low fire. 
looks pretty good. I'm within my set. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring this up in the high five. So I'm using the right arrow and bringing the level up to 50%. I'm watching my gas pressure, seeing where I'm dropping, seeing if I'm seeing fluctuations. I'm on propane, this is a good time to diagnose if I got the volume and if my regulators are working properly. Keep the manometer on there. A lot of guys tend to check the gas pressure and want to take the gas manometer off immediately. But leave it right on there as you're doing the setup. That way we can see the drop as well. 80%. Now I'm at 100%. Again, my target O2, the top line, I'm looking for 395. A CO2, 95, and my CO below 150. And I haven't dropped below five, and I have not dropped, I don't think I dropped more than an inch. Close, but we're, we're good, we're in there. All right, so it looks like we flattened out right there and stabilized. So this is where you'd print it off. I'll show you something, guys, really cool. Is that with the app that Crocom has, basically you just hit it and you can press this one button and it sends a report right to your phone. And then all I gotta do is I can email that right off or I can just take a screenshot and I have it for the registration. It's super simple to use this analyzer. But if you have a roller, UEI, back rack, testo, just take a screenshot of it in the high file. All right. So if we were off, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come up to this brass screw right here. And I'm going to adjust this so you guys can see what happens. That brass throttle screw, I'm going to go counterclockwise one full turn. So I basically opened up the throttle. I didn't change the pressure. I just allowed more gas to come through that throttle. The fan is pulling it through. That's all I've done. So I richened it up. My O2 came down. And I'm running a little lean, I mean, a little rich. And you can see on my CO, I'm a little high. I want to be low 150. I'm 157. So I'm going to give it a couple seconds to see if it comes down a little bit. But they probably had it right on. So it was on the spoiler before me. So I'm going to go back in clockwise a little bit. Go back a half, half turn. Right there is almost perfect. 
three nine nine six and one forty four. That's pretty close to target if it stays right there. And the gas pressure still looks good. So I like that. And that's in high fire. That's the initial. This is the basic commissioning setup. In high fire, making these adjustments on the throttle. I like it. Everything looks good. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to bring it into low fire. So I'm going to hit the left arrow and bring this back down to 1%. Now, when I do this, I'm going to, not going to just go all the way down to 1%. I'm going to bring it down to like 75. Watch my gas pressure. You should see that steady go up, not jump around everywhere. That way I can make sure my regulator is doing what it's supposed to. So I'm on propane. My meter's working good. Bring it down to 50. And you can do this in space heating. Um, if the thermostat's turned up to dump the heat. I'm actually doing it in domestic. Right behind me, I have four showers. So I can dump all this heat pretty effectively. Bring it down to 25%. So when we get in the low fire, we just need to be on the CO2 between nine and 10, and the O2 between three and four A5. And we'll bring it down to 1%. There we're at low fire. We'll give this a few minutes to plane out. Our CO is still at 60, everything's dropping. It should take a few minutes. Josh, maybe before uh, we move on with this, do you wanna just do a quick bio break for everybody while we wait for this to level out? Yes, let's, uh, yeah, let's take a break and then we'll, um, so the next step is going into if this thing isn't running rich enough and getting into the offset through and adjusting that. So, okay. All right. Everybody's had their 10 minutes. So, hopefully, most people are back. If you want to carry on, and we can get through this and into the next section. All right. So, we're going to look at the low fire now. Go back in, turn everything off, go back into our installer settings. Okay. All right, we fired off, analyzer is doing its thing. So we set this up with that throttle and high fire. Then we bring it down to low fire and the majority of the time it's right in there. It should be right in there within our parameters. And then we're done, we walk away. That's commission. You take a picture of that low fire and we're good. This one we gotta let it go because I had my analyzer in when we light it off. So when we first do the initial light off, it runs rich on the ignition and we'll start coming up. Our CO will go down and we'll see where we're at. All right, it looks like we planed out three, three on our O2, three, four. And we need to be between three and 45. We're there. CO needs below 10, we're good. And our CO2, 
between nine and 10 and we're right about there. So that looks good. So I would say probably all of your, 99% of your natural gas installs are gonna go just like that. Done, smooth, easy. Propane, I would say 80% 80, 80 of your installs are gonna go like that. We find propane in some cases, we have leaner mixes for, for whatever reason, and we don't run rich enough. So let's say this is propane and my high fire was good, but I went to my low fire and I was running much too lean. Let's say I was running, my O2 was up in the sixes on low fire. Well, that tells me I don't have enough pressure coming through my gas valve. This is where we do our offset adjustment, okay? And the offset adjustment is only done in low fire. We set the offset adjustment, we adjust it, get it within spec, try to hit the target, and then we put it back together, the cap back on there, we bring it to high fire check, and that's it. So, this is natural gas, a little bit different. I can't 100% recreate it, but let's say the O2 again is running at six and we're running way too lean. We need to adjust that gas pressure. We're going to, and I'm just gonna shut this off, is what I'm gonna do. There you go. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna remove this cap and I'm gonna remove this 90, this outlet 90 right here. All right, so this is that the gas valve you're gonna be looking at it just like this. Right in the boiler. It's gonna look just like that in orientation. And this is gonna be the outlet 90. So the outlet 90 you're gonna remove. And we're gonna ask you, this is the throttle. We want you to look in there and open up your throttle screw here so the throttle is completely open. We want to confirm that we're completely open. We're getting the maximum amount of gas. So you can see that white in there. As I'm opening it, it's going away. Boom. That throttle is completely open now. Kind of hard to see. All that light gone away. So from there, this throttle screw now, you're not going to touch again. We're only going to adjust this. Torque. This is torque. And we have instructions on this, so reach out. We'll definitely get you paper instructions, shows you all the pictures and all that. Inside here, we have, this is a T40 torque cap and a T40 torque screw. What I'm gonna have you do, if you're on the phone with me, is grab a magic marker and mark the 12 o'clock position on the threads and on the screw. That way we know our starting reference point. And also if a service technician goes in there, he knows you adjusted that. So kind of a nice little thing to do for the next guy. So we're gonna have it in low fire. We're gonna be running and I'm gonna take this thing and I'm gonna turn it very slow about that far. Looks like almost nothing. If it's not there, I'm gonna turn it clockwise. And this is in the instructions. You increase your gas pressure by turning it clockwise, decrease it clockwise. That's the most I've ever had to turn 
one of those, about a quarter turn. All right, there's a very fine adjustment. You'll turn this probably about that much, and you'll see it move probably two points. So you just gotta be careful on that. So your low fire, you get it there dialed in with this, and then that's it. You don't touch that throttle again, we leave it wide open. We put our cap back on. We go to our high fire settings. Confirm that's good. And once we set this, that high fire is usually always right in target. If it's not, call us and we'll go through some other stuff. There's probably another issue going on, but that's how you adjust that offset. Now that's all dependent, making sure you have good gas pressure. That's the first thing we need to confirm. Because if your gas pressure is way off or dropping too much, then I don't want to go adjust that yet. I want to check our gas pressure, get that in check. Once that is, then we can move on. So that's how we adjust that offset. Um, we get that question a lot. It's not on all propane applications, it's on some. And we're finding linear mixes or leaning gas or just crappy fuel that we need to richen it up. Um, I've only had to do it a handful of times. I've only talked to a few contractors and walked them through it, but you guys know how at first we were wanted guys to call us on this and we didn't release those instructions, but we decided to release them so that you guys have that info and you guys want to do it in the field in case we can't get a hold of one of us. So pretty simple. Just don't turn the torques too fast um, and too much because you can bind it up. That's another thing to watch out for. So <clears throat> the next thing I guess we can address is the, I think somebody had a question on the, on the noise howling. Um, that technically is caused, it's really technically caused when it's running really lean. So we'll have the flame kind of rolling in the burner not getting out of the burner. And that's when that, technically happens and it's uncertain gas pressures and gas setups and venting, everything's just in the right way, it can cause that. We have found it happen on some earlier models on propane with real lean mixes. And we had come out with a conversion kit that is updated with new fan speed and um the venturi has larger orifices so the thing runs a little richer essentially and it's pretty much taking care of that problem but if you have a howling boiler you do come across it and your specs are all in your gas pressure is good your venting's good everything's crossed off um give us a call we can walk through increasing our ignition fan speed and also playing around with the elevation usually takes care of it um but the foam we got to make sure that's in there um, and then also our venting done correctly and a couple other things. But essentially that's what's caused. It doesn't happen in a lot, it's happened in a handful of them, but there's definitely ways we can fix it and take care of that issue. Hopefully that answered it. And I guess kind of a, just a three in one question, so three, three separate questions, but I think they're, um, they're all kind of within the same realm. So if you've got to pick one parameter to be perfect because you can't get all of them exactly on, which is the best parameter to be perfect. Uh, and then when you were doing the setup, uh, you, like our, our manual specifies that O2 at low fire should be the same or higher uh, than at high fire, but we actually had it slightly off from that. Uh, yeah. I, is there a I scenario where that's... I wouldn't have put 100% on the accuracy of this gas valve. <laughs> um, we've made this thing fail on purpose. This thing's probably been adjusted 2,000, 3,000 times and the offset. So, so yeah, if it was off a little bit. So okay. I wouldn't be concerned with this one. In the field, it definitely should be on, but these boilers are training boilers. We put these through the, the paces, let's say. They run pretty rough. We run these things down to 1% O2, up to 10%, try to get them to kick out. So, 
they've been through a lot. Okay. Um, um, and if you're able to get everything else in the spec, something that some guys are seeing specifically on propane is CO being elevated and they can't get the CO down. Everything else is spot on, but they cannot get the CO level in range. Is there anything they can do to correct that um, in field? So I haven't had the only, uh, I'll say this. Uh, tech calls and job site visits, I've had that issue. It's not, it's not the setup. It's something usually to do with the venting. So my first question would be, what is the vent termination that you're using? And, and how does that venting install? What does it look like? Um, typically, I don't think I've ever had that issue where if our, everything's in spec and the, the boiler is installed correctly, where we've had CO that's been drastically high at a parameter and our O2 has been in check and our CO2 has been in check. So um, Josh, does that mean that it's possibly a uh, result of uh, cross-contamination? Could be cross-contamination, but usually it's a restriction or it's uh, the exhaust not being able or being expelled from the heat exchanger is building up. Um, whether that's ice, snow, whatever, debris, pipe not sized correctly, reduced down, not an approved vent termination, um, exceeding the length. Uh, I've seen it happen on delayed ignitions with ignition issues, but usually it was a grounding problem or the installation error, they drop wiring on the grounding, we're having delayed ignition. Uh, gas pressure issues can cause that. So if we have you know, enough gas pressure, too much gas pressure. So there's a lot of things. That I, I'd have a lot of questions on that specifically. If you, okay. If you so a, if that if that issue does come up in the field, we'd re, we'd highly recommend calling into the uh, Triangle Tube Tech Support line and uh, addressing 100%. it. Okay. 100%. The the that last question. Common. Okay. Perfect. The last question that popped up: um, Is there a different venturi uh, to be used on the boiler when you convert to propane? Yes. Yes, there is. So, okay. Yes, I think I said that. So the these triangle tubes will come with a natural gas venturi installed, and then there'll be a LP venturi in the box. Perfect. And sure. you'll just swap it out. That venturi, they'll be they'll take off the um, they'll take off this in the boot. They'll remove that venturi. Put the new venturi on and then put this intake boot back on mechanically that's the only thing you have to do for the conversion then you just change the appliance setting and if it's a 110 or 155 you add that second piece of foam on the intake ah, got good. it okay so piping So we have some piping installations here on a few of them. So this one, combi, uh, this is, you know, really the best way to do it. If you get a low loss header, nice, clean, compact. Um, we have that hydraulic separation. We have that air separation. Our domestic comes out, flush valve, mixing valve, not required, but definitely recommended. Um, pretty simple. Then over and this one, this one is a one ninety nine combi. We are using uh, that header kit going into an air separator um, and a return. I'll just say that I didn't install the system; somebody else did. And I won't throw them under the bus. But I would have liked to see more separation here. All right, it gets real turbulent in here. Coming off closely spaced T's or a header kit here, I want at least 12 inches into my air separator so that um, the air can settle in the top of the pipe a little bit and get better air separation. Also, on the closely spaced T's, I want a little bit of separation on my return side. That way, 
we're not affecting the flow through my primary. So I probably would have left a little bit. I don't, I'm tight in this room, the boilers next to each other. So I get why it was done this way. But just note, if you are using closely spaced T's and you're using for a header kit, you do need to leave some separation. You can't just install these items right up next to each other. You could have issues with hydraulic separation and also it's gonna make it a hard time to remove that air from the system. The next one we have is a webstone kit. I think a few manufacturers make this, but it's just a closely spaced T kit. Again, this one's pretty tight as well, but it shows this is a heat only. So we have our system pump, okay? Now on the pumps and the system pumps, combis, they have it. The boilers that are heat only, you would need to supply it. So these charts we'll go over, I'll pull the power, uh, the manual. Once we get done looking at these, I'll show you guys, but the 110, um, you're gonna wanna use, if you're using a, a Grunfist 1558, totally good, that's totally fine. Um, Taco though, 007 ECMs, no. Those pumps have a feature where they actually shut off. So we'll have Delta T and we'll have high temp lockout. Stay away from those. Great pumps on the secondary side, not great boiler pumps. Um, so on the 110 and the 155, you can use a 0015 ECM Taco, but it's gonna be on speed three, high. The low and medium speeds have that safety feature. The high speed doesn't. So you're totally fine going with that. But if you're doing a 155 and you want a full output or a 199, the Taco, you're gonna to wanna to use a 0013 or a 2400 series. 0013 is probably normally stock and cheaper. And for the Grunfist, you're gonna to wanna to use a 2699. So that's if you wanna get the full output of that 155 and that 199, all right? Those are our pump recommendations. The application guide that's online at our website, and I'll pull it up and I'll show you, has that chart in there, so you don't really need to remember that. But again, these heating only boilers are, uh, the next version will have the system pump installed, so you won't need to worry about that anymore. But for right now, the heating only boilers, if you're gonna use them, just keep in mind, those are our pump recommendations. And also, if you're gonna be doing an indirect, match your indirect pump with your boiler pump, if you're doing it on the primary side. If you're doing it indirect on the secondary side, use whatever pump you want, doesn't matter. <coughs> but we want adequate flow on the indirect. Um, and then obviously we went and looked at the floor boiler already on that install. And then once you do the primary boiler piping, these are some boiler board installations that we have here. Just showing the secondary side. Again, our boiler, you know, realistically is just meeting the demand of that low loss header. The secondary side is hydraulically separated on its own. So you wanna use zone valves, you wanna use system pumps, totally fine. ECMs, it doesn't matter, but we just need that hydraulic separation between our two systems, okay? Um, one thing to note with closely spaced T's, I've seen Delta T issues where you have the closely spaced T's and this hydraulic separation or the uh, air separation is like 10 feet away. I've seen air issues with that where we pocket air and we can have delta T problems. So make sure that air separations within five feet of those closely spaced T's to avoid any problems. Cool. All right, so these are the application guides we now have online for our boilers. The installation guide has piping instructions and some piping diagrams. These application guides I think are a lot better. Um, they offer some more options on how to set the pump preset if you want to do some flexible pumping. And if we go down, the pump. This is our pump recommendation. You can see we have 007s in here. But just notice they're not ECM. These are just standard pumps. And the 0015 shows the standard pump. 
we thought that the Keiko on three, the third speed had that safety feature where it shut off, but it doesn't. So we can use an ECM gain of 20 degree delta T. And then 0013 and 2699. And are you guys using Wheelo pumps up there? Uh, yeah, we have uh, some access to them. They're not super, super popular, mainly Grumpus and Takeo that you see the most of. Yeah, that's what we have. Wheelo, they came here and we had epic failures and they pretty much went away. We don't see them anymore. It's pretty much Grumpus and Takeo and B&G. So looking at some of the piping diagrams, again, closely spaced T options, well, well, header. All right. Get into some of the design stuff. So I think a lot of these piping diagrams that we show now, we're showing the indirects on our secondary side. Um, which is totally fine. Um, but you can do it on the primary side too. I think we have a uh, shot of what it looks like on the primary side. So one thing I want to know is on the wiring and installation. So let's take this system for example. We have a low loss header, boiler pump pumping into that. On the secondary side, we have an indirect and we have three zone pumps. We're using a TACO uh, SR control, okay? We're using an outdoor sensor, low voltage wiring terminals, high voltage wiring terminals. So we got a power supply coming into our boiler. We got our boiler pump wired directly to the boiler. We have our DHW pump wired to our DHW. Our aquastat is wired into our DHW aquastat. We're not using this control to do priority. We're using that boiler, which we want to. We want to use the post pump functions. We want to that maximize efficiency. It's the best way to do it. So one thing is, is if this calls, this indirect, how do we shut off these other zones? So what you do is because we have this zone controller, all these pumps are going to here, our CH pump is not being used. So we take the L connection and we run it to ZC on the control and we move the ZRZC jumper. That way, when our tank calls, it sends power out to CH1, which disables these zones and these pumps stop working. So that's one thing to note because a couple of manufacturers out there can't do that. So um, it gives us true priority on that tank when we're using an auxiliary control. Uh, let's take a look. Okay, so this is an indirect. Uh, all right, so this is the indirect off the primary side. I see some issues with this in the field quite a bit on the piping. The one thing with this, it shows check valves right here. Um, I don't think in our day and age we need these anymore because pretty much every pump out there has an internal check. So as long as your pump has an internal check right here and here, these are not needed, okay? So the way this works is your heating comes on, the pump pushes water up through this way, the check valve in here prevents the water flow back to your indirect, pumps up to the boiler, out to the supply in the system. And that does that little loop right there. Your domestic calls, this pump immediately shuts off, but this pump kicks in. Why we need the both the same size pumps to flow. This pump pumps in, check valve prevents it from going this way, moves it up to the boiler, out to the supply and through here. This is the way we recommend piping the indirect on the primary side. You do it this way, we've had no issues. I've seen guys do the boiler pump on the return and they'll do the supply pump on the other side. And then with closely spaced T's, I've seen delta T issues with this, the delta T lockout. So if you're doing your indirect on the primary side, just put both pumps on the return with check valves installed, pumping into the boiler and your supply line is just going out to the indirect and your header or closely spaced feed and you'll have no issues with that. That's one I see get messed up quite a bit. Um, let me go down. 
This is showing indirect on the secondary with uh, us using the, let's say this is the Taco 0018 and we pressure balance it with the radiant flame. Or well, we got a pressure balancing valve here, which is the best way to do it. Um, but if you don't want to use the pressure balancing valve and tie your supply into the return header, that 0018E Taco pump is a great pump because you can use a Bluetooth app and set your, your uh, GPM with it. This is showing us using the boiler with no auxiliary control on this. Okay. Then here, pretty much the same thing. Showing a zone valve control in this one. Again, indirect on the secondary side. Just showing the indirect off the primary side using zone valves. So this application guide are really, they're great. We put a lot of information in here. Pretty much most of these piping diagrams are what most people are running into. But it also gives you your pump settings, what it recommends for your pumps depending on the installation. Let's see if there's anything else down here that we need to go over. And this one's showing, so say if we're using, going back to the CH1 and CH2 differential curves, this is showing we're using a high temp fan coil, say 180 going through this when CH1 calls, <coughs> and then when CH2 calls, it's running at a low temp, we still need that mixing valve in there to mix that down and protect it. Uh, this is showing the cascading. So this is showing a cascading. So we have the supply sensor in here. Let's go here or here. On the low loss header, it doesn't really matter. As long as it's more of an immersion well, that's really what we gotta be concerned with. Um, so the heat, these are heating only. So we have those pumps that we've sized accordingly in here. Um, you could do reverse return on your boilers if you wanted to, but you don't need to with ours. You don't request it. You got an indirect on the secondary side. And then this is showing your um, cascading gable. So on your main control board, you'll just plug into your connection here and then we'll go to the next one, to the next one, to the next one. And then all the control you've done inside. All your wiring, all your sensors, your calls will all go into your master boiler. So if you're running outdoor reset, you don't hook up another sensor to the second and third boiler or the call, everything goes into that master boiler, okay? And this is just going through the combination units. Pretty much the same stuff on the boiler piping, except we just have the less of the indirect water heater. And that's pretty much it for the piping. Do I have any questions on piping? Is there anything on there? Uh, nothing came through for piping. There was a couple of questions on pump conflict, but I think that we got that all squared away. Um, everything looks good to me. Uh, I don't think I missed anything, so I think you're good to go. Um, what do you want to have next? Yes. I think that's service. You want to remove the burner? Let's take a look inside the heat exchanger. Cool. So yeah, actually we can hit on the cleaning. Let me just stop sharing. Yeah. 
for a somewhat disassembled disk boiler. So removing our top plate. So we're gonna do a cleaning on the unit. Um, we're gonna remove our electrical connections. I've already taken off and loosened up our bolts up here. Um, I've taken off the bracket for the gas valve. We can move this out of the way. Makes it a little bit easier. We've moved the intake boot over here. Let's just take our igniter. Feed off, grounding wire. Pop my igniter out. Igniter gap, we're looking at about an eighth of an inch separation. We're gonna inspect it, make sure it's nice and clean. A lot of corrosion, we'll just replace it. Also, when looking for sparking spots, if it's sparking up against here on the plate, if something doesn't look right, maybe it's sparking through here, I'll go ahead and replace that. Burner out. And there's the shot of the heat exchanger. Well, it's never been fired, so it's just a tear down unit. Looks pretty clean. So we'll get in here, inspect, we'll brush it out, clean it all out. Uh, what I've kind of recommended for for guys to do is to remove our condensate trap on the bottom back here and to get a little fern co cap pop that on there and get a cleaning solution whatever your local wholesaler sells we don't want to use anything too abrasive or harmful on the heat exchanger um, just anything that's a stainless steel grade cleaner cut it with some water and then fill this heat exchanger up get a good soak on it. You can't get brushes down in through these tubes. These tubes are pinched off every inch or so. So you can't actually push something down through them. So get a good soak on them. Then go ahead, remove the Fernco cap on bottom, let everything drain out. And if you have any of these tubes that are plugged, they'll hold that water. Um, then you can go ahead and get like a small, washing machine hose or a little hose that will fit in these holes and you can go through and try blowing each one of them out. If you've got a plug heat exchanger, it's pretty drastic. Your combustion probably settings were off and it was probably on propane for that to happen. Um, but that's a, a good way for a real deep cleaning on the unit. Most cases you can just spray a solution in there, run water through it, spray water through it, you'd be totally fine with a, with a good setup. And if your venting is correct and not cross contaminated. Okay, that's pretty much it. We're cleaning the heat exchanger. Um, everything should flush right out. Clean your condensate trap, inspect that. If there's any damage, replace it. Change out your condensate neutralizer. Make sure that's all free and clear. Make sure the neutralizer is not partially plugged up on the outlets because that can back up and create um, ignition issues. Um, go through, visually inspect the unit. See if you have any leaks anything doesn't look right. Um, that's really the big thing is making sure we don't have like the high vent leaking and that drips down, drips in the sensor, kills the sensor. Those are usually the killers on high efficiency boilers is there leaks somewhere 
and that leak dropping something out. Not big on our boiler because we have a lot of space in here, but some other manufacturers where everything's jammed right in there, that's typically what happens. We have that water leaks down and it goes everywhere. So just be mindful of that. Um, check your flame signal, make sure that's still strong. I change the igniter every couple of years at least. <coughs> the burner head, we want to inspect, make sure that looks good. So I can turn this down. So our gasketed insulation, insulation turn this off. Brand new. So it's all one unit. So this part will set right down on top of the burner. Here's our gasket and our insulation. It's all one piece. So if you're doing a cleaning, let's say this insulation is really bad. We got to replace it. One little trick is this. You can kind of see it where we pulled off that insulation. You get this white fuzz up here and that can clog up that burner. head. All right. That can prevent us from getting a good solid flame through there. So we want to keep this nice and clean. So the burn head too, you want to pop off the screws, pull this out, take a compressor and just lightly blow the inside out and clean everything out and try to spray all that, that gunk out. So we're going to reinstall the insulation. What I would recommend doing is getting a plastic bag. I think it's something around here. Hey, Josh, the question came through is if you, uh change the gasket every time that you pull the burner. Um, and as far as I know, the gasket comes with the burner head when you replace it, does it not? No, the gasket that's in between the burner head here comes with it. That gasket, this insulation doesn't. It's separate. Got it. Do we, so, do, and would you change that one when you do pull it off or just, is it good to reuse? I'd probably change, well, Depending, and there's lots depending on it, the burner setup, propane, whatever. But um, chances are you're not going to have to change that every year. Maybe you change it every three to four years. Um, but that's if you're not venting properly. You start overheating in the top here. You get discoloration. I mean, both these kind of look fine. This one's obviously been on and off a bunch of times. But <laughs> if we see overheating, we'll see a lot of discoloration through here. Um, and then also we want to inspect and make sure our gasket's good. If you have any deforming, cracking, um, you removed it and damaged it, obviously we want to replace that. Um, but we would go when we take this off or we replace it. <coughs> we do replace it. This thing comes in a plastic bag. Take that plastic bag, put it over the burner head and then slide the insulation over that and then remove the plastic bag. And that will prevent any of this insulation getting caught up in the burner head. Cool. So that's a little trick on the um, reinstallation. So if you do have to reinstall the same gasket, you pulled it off, just you know put a plastic bag in there and try to, to carefully take it off or put a plastic bag on there and put it back on. So. Cool. That's a little something to keep this nice and clean. Um, check your, if you get an igniter, you're going to get new gaskets and, and all that, but check your gasket. Make sure you don't see any signs of leakage around your sight glass and also the igniter gasket. So if you're going to change the igniter, it will come in with a new gasket, so that's fine. Um, and then just look around the fan. Make sure you don't see any signs of uh, leakage coming through the fan and the fan gasket. Um, you could pull the inventory if you wanted to, um, and you could take a look at the inside of the venturi. Because this is pretty much the point where if you've got crap coming in the intake, this is where it's gonna get caught up. It's gonna get caught up in the venturi. Also for cross contaminating, this is where we're gonna see signs of that. So you could pull the venturi, inspect it, make sure my flappers are working okay, nothing's broken. Um, nothing's cracked up into this plastic. Those would all be pretty good indications if we're cross contaminating. We'll see discoloration and this plastic will get really brittle and could crack because as we're bringing in cold air and warm air, expansion and contraction, if this thing 
gets exposed to a lot of acidic condensation, that could be an issue. So I would inspect this, pop that back on there. If you change the venturi, it does come with a new O-ring here if you replace it. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much pulling the heat exchanger and then putting everything back. You'll put everything back in. Let's just go ahead and reinstall that. And we'll hit on one little thing here. Gaskets on, head back down there. All right, so these burner nuts, the burner plate nuts. It's in our, uh, I think it's in the service guide that you get with the boiler. We have torque specs. We give you torque specs in all these. Now, I know not everybody carries torque wrenches. If you're looking for some, uh, I think it's Vera or Wera, W-E-R-A, makes some really nice torque wrenches. They're a little pricey, but you pay for what you get. These work really well. You don't want to over torque these. So a couple things is we over torque these and really wrench them down. You could break those studs. And these ones, I have not seen that yet. You'd have to get it really hard, but you could flatten out and smush out this gasket if you really torque it down too much. And then that could be a potential leak on the heat exchanger plate. So I believe off the top of my head, I think it's 40 pounds or 35 pounds torque. So you'll just torque those down and then just do that in an offset. Um, but this, um, this and that igniter too, I'd probably torque. The igniter's just gotta be snug. You get it down there snug, do like a half turn and that's it. You don't wanna go too much with that igniter because if we go really hard, we could possibly deflect or move the distance in our igniter. So you just want that snug down where it's not gonna leak, but we're not trying to over tighten that. So we smush out the gasket and we have metal on metal. So tell you what, contractors in Maine, it's, it's 200 inch pounds of torque on everything. So I don't know how it's in Canada, but that's what we do out here. Um, we use breaker bars on everything. Yeah, right. I don't, I don't know why we do. But, um, so when you reinstall this too, there are the burner plate extends, has this extension here that goes out and it attaches to the back of the boiler right here. There's one on this side and there's one on the other side right here. You don't need to reinstall those screws for that. This burner plate is extended out there to keep this thing nice and solid during shipping. That's all it's there for. So when you reattach this burner head, you just have to do the bolts. You don't have to do these two screws in the back where you have the arms that come out and reach the back. Okay. So don't worry about having to put those back in. Totally don't have to do it. It doesn't affect the operation of the unit or the, the structural integrity of it. And there's one other thing. Let me just go run and grab. This guy. So when you get the boiler, you'll get bracket that will come on the side of the control. Same thing with this. After you take it off, you can throw this away. This is just for shipping. It prevents the control from swinging around and getting damaged. It holds it in place. As soon as you're done, you get it installed, you can go ahead and take this bracket and toss it. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, yeah, so when you go through the inspection, when you go through the cleaning, also make sure you get all your grounding wires back in. That's when we see guys reinstalling the boilers and leaving a grounding wire off and having failed ignitions. So make sure you get all those back on. And then, like I said, the flat plate, you can flush every year. Um, there are a lot of contractors in this area that will just run it for three years and then just swap them out. Um, you would also pull the flow sensor on the combis. Inspect those. Make sure you see if any damage with the flow wheels. Um, the pump, pretty much as long as it's working, you should be fine. Low water cutoff to remove that. I'll show you guys. So what you're going to do is remove pin right here. Do it out. Your wiring connections. Just twist it and pull up. There's a little water cut off. So if you're having pressure issues, you got water on the system, but you're not reading anything, pull this out, take a look inside, see if you have any debris in there that's preventing this thing from reading pressure. And for service, I think that's about it. There's an inlet screen on the gas valve. So if you have gas issues and you're scratching your head and pressure looks good, but you're getting drops, you can always pull this off, check the inlet screen. There's no inlet screen on the domestic, all right? So you don't have to worry about anything clogging up there. Clarity, all that. Yeah, that's about it for the service. All right, where does it put us for time? We got about 10 minutes left. All right, you guys questions? Anything else you guys want me to go over? Steve wants to talk about the P-trap. P-trap? Condensate trap? I'm, not, trap? I'm assuming that's, that's what you mean is the condensate trap. Cleaning, cleaning of the condensate trap, yes. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's pretty easy. You're just gonna pull it off. Let's go grab one. So the condensate trap, all right? You got that ball in there, it's floating around. This thing will be, you know, if it hasn't been cleaned in a while, brown, gross. Um, before you disassemble the system, I would probably, unless you have an indirect, if it's combi, you're gonna have to do this, but if it's an indirect, no big deal. Um, get a bucket of hot water, maybe a little simple green or a cleaning solution, put it in there, give it a good soak. You can take a brush in there, brush it all out. Remove your connections. If the gaskets are all cruddy and crappy, just order a new one. Just buy a new one and replace it. Don't try to replace the gaskets. I don't think we sell the gaskets individually. It's just easier and cheaper just to replace the trap. It's pretty simple, plastic. There's nothing super technical about it. So brush it out, that's about it.
Any other questions? <clears throat> Nothing else has popped up just yet. Can you believe it went over early? I'm not that good. <laughs> if I miss anything, friends, if we miss any questions, they, they were coming in pretty uh, fast and furious. Um, please do let us know. We stole that from NTI. What did I steal from NTI? We were and we were happy to steal it. Let me tell you that before I know what it is. <laughs> Blame sensor test. Yeah. It was the trap. Apparently, we sold the trap from NTI. Yeah, I mean, no, they stole it from us. We had it first. Boom. There you go. I just checked the parts list. We actually we have some washers for condensate traps in the list. So oh, we can you get them it? if we can get them if you really want, I guess. I'm gonna say if those things are foobar, then you probably want to replace the trap anyway. Yep. So Mike Ramps, somebody asked this, you're just gonna have one lead coming from the ignition module. And then you have your other lead. Right there. It should be in my crap signal. Brand new meter, so go get used to this one. I like my UEI one better. Oh, let's see, let's fire this thing off. First. Somebody asked about the micro ramp signal, so I'm gonna go ahead and set that test up right now. There's also been quite a few comments on the uh, combustion analyzer that you were showing off the CROCOM. Um, yeah. I did put, put my number in the contact chart. If anyone has any questions with the CROCOM, feel free to give me a call after this. Uh, it's not anything completely finalized yet, but I'm happy to uh, take down some names and numbers and we are working on something. My mic ramp signal, you can see it on the meter going up as we go into high fire. But if we go down to the control, You can see too, as we go to low fire and high fire, it actually shows us flame will change in the picture as it starts ramping down. Domestic, we want off in high fire, we go ramp, we ramp right up. Heating, we go into low fire and we slowly ramp up. There's ionization current. In the boiler, running a live time. Now. 
So you can look at your ionization current through the control, but if you do it through a meter, it's a little, it's, it's more accurate. I know we say you can look at the ionization, but if you're really trying to troubleshoot, um, I, I will probably do a meter. That way I can look at the temp. And again, to do that is you have it set on your microamp and you run it in series. So you'll come through one lead. So the red wire up here is your flame signal. It just goes down around here, in the back comes around here. The pull it goes through the red lead into the meter, comes out the meter and into the spade connector. So it completes the circuit. And you're just running your meter in series. It's reading it, but you're not interrupting that signal. So the boiler will still fire and run totally fine. That's how you check your um, microwave. And if you wanted to, I mean, I guess you could pull, you could pull it up here too and run it in series. It doesn't really matter either, either way. Here's just a little more convenient because it's right in front of you. Perfect, thank you, Josh. Um, uh, analyzer, run through this real quick. So this is the Crocom. Yeah, cool. Um, it's a good analyzer. I got a, I used to rep test though. I got one at home. Never comes out of the box anymore. I got a Wohler that I use that does a lot of technical stuff um, just because of some of the computer programming that it has on the back end. But for, for you guys, this is a great analyzer. So charger working from the top, the standard phone charger that you'd have, a lightning charger, or whatever. I think it's Android. So you can charge it and you can pump and charge at the same time. This bracket does not come with it. I made that, so don't think that's gonna come with it. Hose, lead. You can cut this hose and shorten it down if you want, which is nice. Condensate trap. I think a few manufacturers use this type of condensate trap. There's a little filter in there. And on the bottom, you have your temperature probe. You can use another temperature probe if you want to do intake air temperature. You have positive and negative pressure ports, and then the connection for the analyzer. Uh, magnets in the back. And the so our rep agency, JK Sales here, has this analyzer, and they gave this one to me for free, to be all honest. And um, they market it, it's made out of the same plastic material as motorcycle helmets. So they take these analyzers when they're doing trainings and sales pitches and they just throw them on the ground and they work awesome. So they're very, very rugged. Comes with a printer, depending on which model you buy. I think they're being, they're priced under a grand, all right? Um, with all these features, which is really nice. And if we go, hopefully my headphones don't kick out, but if I go to the app, so we can do our combustion analysis, store all our settings. We can go into your stored log. I don't store many of them. I usually store them all in the app, to be honest. I don't see too many on here. So no logs today, browse all logs. You can go into your log, get all your information. Just a reminder to the uh, att attendees left on the call, you know, this is this is all you need to get and, you know, you can use the Crocom or whatever else one, but this is all you need to get into that uh, labor um, warranty allowance program. It just just register the unit and submit your commission and analysis. You, you got to do it anyway for setup. It takes 10 minutes to send it through online and the amount of headaches and pain points that you can take away just by submitting it and getting your labor already preset and done in case anything does happen down the road 
Uh, this makes it super duper easy. So just want to keep that one in mind. This is the Crocom app. So all you do is hit that button right there and it connects through Bluetooth. Okay. Wife's trying to call me. <laughs> Boss can wait. Um, so it connects through Bluetooth, so it's connected. So you're in your combustion analysis. Everything looks good. There's a picture of the phone right here. You just press this button and you watch that right here, this information. Boom. It's there. So it loaded that that quick. You don't have to hold it right up next to it. I'm just doing it for the camera. So the reports, you just go and open your report. Click on the report I want, email it, boom, done. There's my report, fancy letterhead, all my settings. I want to go ahead and send it to myself, done. It's emailed. I can take a screenshot, whatever. So everything's logged in my phone. The app is super easy to use. The other big thing is these analyzers is they have, um, so like our rep agency down here is set up so they can do the calibrations in the field. So you can, they'll have counter days at wholesalers and stuff where you come in and get lunch, bring in your analyzer and they'll calibrate it right there on spot. So um, I think that is awesome. Their office too will also have a com uh, calibration spot, but um, they need to be calibrated every year, like every other analyzer out there. I can tell you, no matter what any analyzer company says, their sensors are good for about 13, 14 months. And they need to be exercised every really every week. But if you use it a lot more than that, then the de you decrease the life on those sensors as well too. So with the amount of me using my analyzers, I'm probably, uh, I probably calibrate mine every nine, 10 months, just because I'm using it every single day. Um, but it handles the high CO really well. I've hit a couple jobs where I've, spiked this thing up to 10,000 and had no issues with it. It's been really good. Wohler, same thing. I've used that one, spiked that one. It still worked great. Didn't kill the sensors. Um, you'll have some guys say, you know, you shouldn't put it in as they do the startup, but had no problems with it. It's worked great. I can't say anything really bad about the analyzer, you know? Um, I had to pay for it. It would have been a pretty good price. I think they come in around 900 bucks is what they're selling them down here for. So. Awesome. And yeah, our, our numbers are in the uh, contact here for just like I said, just give us a shout afterwards and we'll let you know what we're up to. And no promises just yet, but we're happy to take down any information. Um, and with that, we are at uh, four o'clock. That is technically all the time that we have. Um, I want to thank everybody very very much for giving us the time today these will be you know regular things that we do here with uh, triangle tube training so uh, stick around for a lot more this whole presentation is going to be posted online asap um, we do have your contact information from registration so you get a little follow-up note from us um and yeah don't be afraid to call question we are we are absolutely here to help and we i, I can't stress that one enough um we know that the training uh, is long overdue, and we're happy to provide many, many more of these. Uh, we're good for site visits. We're good for anything that you need. Um, so just don't don't be shy. Contact us as as often as you possibly can for whatever you need.